I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. The context of this uh, paper, paper that I'm, that I'm uh, want to give the outline today for, was the passing of uh, Dr. Carr. Um, for a little bit of a small little thumbnail sketch of the background, uh, for about I guess maybe the past seven years or so, six or seven years, um, I had discussed on and off with Dr. Clark the uh, possibility of his beginning to discuss in his lectures his intellectual influences, um, which he's always done, but um, kind of in, in a more systematic fashion to leave us with that blueprint, because a number of the people who were very influential in his development are folk with whose, name, whose names we're familiar but oftentimes get lost in the shuffle beyond just you know their names. Uh, obviously, people like Arthur Schomburg is very familiar, but beyond Schomburg, people like Henry Proctor Slaughter, uh, certainly Hubert Henry Harrison, a number of other folk who were very important in Clark's development. And uh, on several occasions, we were actually able to sit at length and discuss the genealogy, um, dwelling in particular on some of the, the broader figures, people like Hubert Harrison and, and John Jackson, who exerted a very serious influence on, on John Henry Clark, even down to his style. And I didn't realize how significant an influence John G. Jackson had had on John Henry Clark until the first time that I actually heard John G. Jackson's voice and listened to him, and even heard in terms of speech, mannerisms, and analogies the similarities between John Jackson and John Henry Clark. And of course, uh, John Jackson was a little older than John Henry Clark, but he was the one who sponsored John Henry Clark for membership in the Harlem YMCA History Club, which eventually became known as the Edward Blyden Society. And of course, John Jackson co-authored with Willis Huggins what could probably be considered one of the early textbooks of black studies, uh, an introduction to African civilizations with main currents in Ethiopian history, which uh, actually had the second section of the book was devoted to a poll of black colleges to find out what black studies courses they were teaching at the black colleges. So black studies, contrary to some popular opinion, didn't start in the 1960s, although it was certainly radicalized in the 1960s. Uh, we see its origins much further back. With Dr. Clark's passing, um, the ritual of his passing, and, and th there are those of us who, uh, who were there, um, uh, thinking about those of us in the society was there, and uh, Kathy was there, and a number of us probably were there, you know, kind of. In dealing with the ritual, and you know the old saying in the African community that in the United States, funerals are for the living, which is probably consistent. In watching the process and the rituals of grieving, it caused me to think again about the context of Dr. John Henry Clark's life. Uh, particularly when we think about the notion of ritual, something uh, to which we've received a good grounding before this session. Um, the context of ritual in society. Funerals oftentimes uh, provide um, a moment for reflection. And I got a letter about a month later, and uh, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with the God tradition, but perhaps in Europe or another, they're a similar tradition. Uh, you know, Dr. Clark was initiated as, uh, or instilled as a chief in the God, or a ruler in the God tradition. And at the uh, funeral, Brother Small, James Small mentioned that, and uh, Dr. Jeffries mentioned that there was a 40-day grievance period. And I know when Abiola, uh, Moshud Abiola passed in uh, Nigeria, there was a similar period, and I don't, know, I don't know how long it is in the year, but when there's a burial, it's 40 days. Okay, and there was supposed to be a ritual of celebration after that, consistent with Dr. Clark's uh, you know, instillment. And I don't know if that took place or not, uh, but in terms of the grieving process, it caused me to reflect on the syncretic nature of African identity, something that John Henry Clark, I think, focused on a lot in his work. You know, the African personality away from home. And he talked about that a lot. Um, laying in the casket, dressed in full African clothing. Not guard, right? <laughs> you get it right. Full African clothing. In a way that, up until that moment, I'd never seen him. Sometimes he has kente, you know, sometimes he would go, increasingly as he got older, but laid out as a, as a ruler. But you typically saw Jeremy Clark in a shirt and tie, or coat. Very syncretic nature. 
And he indeed underwent a name change from John Henry Clark to John Henry Clark after reading Henry Ibsen, uh, An Enemy of the People, the play which talks about uh, what happens when someone challenges state authority. And as a young man reading that play, it gave him a sense of what it meant for a person, in this case, I think in An Enemy of the People it was a doctor who went against uh, the wishes of this company that was poisoning the water in the community and the people didn't want to hear it. So this doctor, for trying to bring the news, the bad news to the community about what was happening, ultimately to help the community, was branded an enemy of the people. It had such an effect on John Henry Clark, because you can hear John Henry is not an unfamiliar name in the South, in Alabama, and Georgia this period. He changed his name from Henry to Henrik, in honor of Henrik Ibsen. Uh, not an African, a Swede. And added an E to the end of Clark, almost as a kind of final flourish of sophistication. You know, young people want to reinvent themselves. But this notion of reinvention is very clear and consistent in Dr. Clark's uh, life. So with that in mind, and I, I, want to mention, I, I got a letter from a brother who teaches at Howard University. We went to school together. He's in the English department. And he wrote me a long letter because he came to the funeral. Uh, Larry Jackson. Larry Jackson, very interesting brother. He grew up on the streets of Baltimore on all the wrong sides of all the fences and all the railroad tracks. You can imagine Larry Jackson was probably there in the middle of it. And somehow got out of that and went to school and uh, we met up in the Midwest, and he uh, eventually finished his PhD at Stanford. So, I mean, complete transformation. White folks would probably think he's a respectable Negro now. And he decided to go teach at a black college. And I'll talk about that as we get through the chronology of Dr. Clark's life, which is not a very popular thing to do now in terms of black faculty. Uh, he didn't have to do it with a PhD from Stanford. He probably could have gone in a number of places, but he chose to go to Howard, wanted to be there. He came to the funeral and wrote me a long letter where he he gave his analysis of what he thought was going on, and it was very close to, 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 to my own thoughts on the subject. A genealogy, and I'll take it from this perspective as we move forward. When we think of the uh, Medunetchik, the ancient uh, Kemetic traditions, when we think of genealogy, we think of apprenticeship. Typically, the uh, most familiar uh, exemplar is probably the scribe, and I had intended, I'll, I'll try to stay away from the blackboard as much as possible. It's the word for uh, scribe, seseshu, or well, scribes would be seseshu in the plural. Singular be sesh, sesh. The sesh, and that's not a very good drawing of it, but the sesh uh, symbol, the glyph, is the writer's palette, ink palette, and stand for their reads. Because to write, is literally to be literate. But not only to be literate in the sense of secesh or scribe, it just doesn't mean to write. When we look at the word for speech, medu, we also see that speech can also be translated as writing, depending on the context. So speaking, writing, communicating information is important. But the way that you receive information is equally important to the communication process. In other words, as I mentioned yesterday, M. Tao Tepa says, good listening is good, or good hearing is good speaking. One must listen and study the apprentice tradition. John Henry Clark represented and represents that apprentice tradition. And it's a tradition that's handed down from generation to generation. Yeah. See that come. <laughs> All right. Um, let me start with the paper. After reading Larry's letter, I sat down and sketched an outline for a, a paper because I thought that what would probably continue, what would happen and continue to happen as we remember John Henry Clark's life was that we begin to reflect on our personal relationships with Dr. Clark and reflect on his life in, in relation to how he touched our lives in terms of that apprentice tradition. But I think that in addition to that, we should begin to try to preserve our tradition in a systematic fashion so that we can bequeath it on to our future generations and that we should try to produce, begin to produce texts. Uh, Barbara Adams talked about a text that she has produced after talking and being with Dr. Clark for a number of years and that's a, that's a, uh, a source we can use. What I hope to do is present another text that can at least start a discussion about Dr. Clark's place, uh, one of his places in, in our tradition. At approximately 2 p.m. on Thursday, July 16, 1998, John Clark joined the ancestors. 
Five days later, a ritual of initiation into eternity was held before several thousand Africans at Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, New York, followed by a final ritual transition and physical interment at Gethsemane Baptist Church in Columbus, Georgia. Bracketed by the twin geographical markers of his dual existence, John Henry Clark completed his earthly run as he had begun it. As an African whose razor-sharp clarity often masked a turbulent voyage, the restlessness of which was represented in grand relief by the nigh-bewildering breadth of cultural, political, and social types attendant at the rituals of transition. If you can imagine a funeral where they had uh, visiting dignitaries from Africa, Cornell West, accompanied by a European, Ben Chavis and the Nation of Islam, directly behind him, Khalid Muhammad, his son, Farrakhan, just giving you a sense for who was there. The black arts poets, Mari Evans, who, like uh, Ashe, uh, Margaret Walker Alexander, who just made her transition, never rides a plane anywhere, took the bus from Indianapolis <laughs> to be there. Sonia Sanchez and Mary Amina Baraka. A group of folk, and Kwame Ture sent his message. A group of folk who had not Dr. Clark been there in even his inner, inner physical form, some of them may have broken out into fisticuffs. But it was this man who brought these disparate groups together, paying homage to him, but also, because funerals are often for the living, situating themselves in a genealogy that now we must begin to examine as we move into the, so as Dr. Uh, Thompson says, white folks 21st century. Six weeks later, before thousands of African Harlemites, assorted Africans from across the eastern seaboard and beyond, and hundreds of New York City police officers, they said 16,000, but that was in the newspapers, so you can't trust what they said. I'm thinking maybe they just said that to spook people. A much less diverse assortment of high-profile African national sympathetic activists, under the direction of Khalid Abdul Muhammad, convened a gathering which called itself the Million Youth March. Simultaneously, before hundreds of African politicians, organizers, and curiosity seekers, over the course of three days, at African political moderates convened a million youth movement, so to speak, in Atlanta, Georgia. In a 1995 article entitled, Why I Oppose the Million Man March, John Henry Clark sounded what became one of the central themes of his last years on Earth. Arguing that the crisis of African misery has always been a fertile ground for political opportunism, Clark roundly criticized Minister Louis Farrakhan for seizing upon the anxieties of Africans in America to fuel his ambitions of political, economic, and religious empire building. I say, thank you, brother. Repeating what Dr. Clark said, and this gets to the essence of really what I want to talk about today. What would Clark have had to say to the parade of social and intellectual dignitaries who pronounced reflection upon their own post-Clark status over his inert form in the ritual at Abyssinian Baptist? What would he have had to say to the fragmented and less than cogent contingent who rehearsed the fatigue slogans and phrases of the Africana Nationalist Movement, the Saturday of the Million Youth March, in his beloved heart? In short, to what, or whom, or what group, or what groups, has or have fallen the tasks of the internal critic, the literal timekeeper, and compass custodians of the Africana nationalist movement. The moment has come for those who were his junior, juniors and students in the Africana nationalist tradition to engage in the sacred and solemn ritual of requiem, the full reflection on the meaning of the timekeeper who has entered his well-earned repose. Dr. Clark's tradition, which he learned at the feet of people like Willis Nathaniel Huggins, Arthur Schomburg, and others, was built on repetition. And we look at the comedic tradition, we see repetition. Scribes learn how to write by repeating. The Arabs picked up on it. You see the Quranic schools, that's what they do. From child, you get your board, you write the Quran. You mess up, that's fine. You write, you write, you write, we waste, we write, you keep your board, we wear it out until it's not, you can't get that wood anymore. Same thing, Re repetition in his didactic way, in his way of teaching, in his instructional, so that we all know now that history is a clock by which people tell their political time of day. It's a compass, a compass with which people, people use to find themselves on the map of human history. We know that history not only tells us who we were, who we are, it tells us what we must become. And then we also know that the relationship of history, of a people to history is like the relationship of a child to his mother. 
We will never forget that. If we don't remember anything else about John Henry Clark. But when we think about John Henry Clark and his relationship, particularly if you remember in uh, Notes for African World Revolution, the poem that begins the book, made forever burned into our memory by Audley Moore, our Queen Mother. Queen Mother Audley Moore, watchman, what's the hour of the night? When we think about the notion of the timekeeper, the clock watcher, the person who makes, as Chancellor Williams immortalized in his book, The uh, Destruction of Black Civilization, The View from the Bridge, we recognize that that is a lonely function. Timekeepers and clock watchers can't leave their post until they're relieved. Timekeepers keep the comp, keep the time for the nation. Compass watchers let us know what our direction is, where we have been, and where we must go. So what happens when a timekeeper makes her or his transition? Does that mean that the clock stops? Or that we lost our way? The function of the internal critic. Let me talk for a moment about the nature of Requiem. I think that's important because when we talk about Requiem, we, 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 there's a very particular uh, moment to that, and I'm not going to go through the entire paper, but I want to focus on a couple of paragraphs. The concept of requiem is familiar to most people who think of the word with regard to the reflection on the life of a recently deceived, deceased person. In fact, in its original Latin meaning, a requiem was the accusative form of the verb requies, or rest, the first word of the introit in the mass for the dead. A special mass said or sung for the repose of the souls of the dead. So we understand in a very clear Roman Catholic tradition, that's where Latin is used. We see requiem in the particular function it had in early European Christianity, particularly in the Catholic Church. It's a particular mass. It's a word or words said in this particular um, intro of the mass for the dead. The concept of the repose or rest of the deceased is, of course, no less important to African cultural traditions than it is to the junior European partners. We gave them the blueprint. They could not read it, but clearly they understood the importance of ancestors from us. Accordingly, speech crafted to communicate with or to or for the deceased is fashioned in concert with didactic messages for the living, a blueprint for evoking the spirit and assistance of the deceased in the affairs of the living. So we say these masses, why? To seek safe passage for the, for the ancestor, to seek communication, but also to provide instruction for the living. With regard to the personal welfare of the, deceased, of the deceased, speech is aimed at adding the voices of the living to the testimony of a well-lived life, fashioned by the deceased while alive, so that before the creator, the recently transcended community member might be pronounced worthy of ancestral veneration and repose. Pron pronounced quite literally in the comedic tradition, ma'ah heru, literally the voice is true. So when the uh, Ten Commandments came out of the so-called negative confessions or the, uh, the uh, 42 declarations of innocence, these were uh, words, speech spoken or jed medu at the moment of transition for an ancestor, for a person entering the ancestral realm, hoping that once their heart was weighed against the feather of Ma'at, with Jehudi at the, at, the, at the scale, with the book of their life, after looking back over their life and what they had and had not done, they might be pronounced the voice is true so that they might move on to the next stage of the so-called hereafter afterlife or the next stage of existence as we call it. So Ma'at Heru is very important. The voice must be true. Nearly two months after his physical passing, and that's when I started this, this uh, thing, we should have been preparing a fitting requiem for John Henry Clark. This essay is a preliminary sketch for a more detailed and expansive contribution to this community requiem, because this is not a requiem that one person could, should, or should even want to try to do. It is rather a community requiem that we must now begin to fashion for our, our ancestor, our young ancestor. The intellectual activist career of John Henry Clark is most effectively read as a consistent exploration of the meaning of nation for people of African descent. Clark spent his life in dialogue with thinkers whose chief concern was the creation of institutional mechanisms for the creation and sustenance of national African identities. His upbringing and early ex uh, intellectual experiences and influences caused him to develop a critical style that was highly suspicious of institutionally trained thinkers. That's going to really make its uh, phase as I get to uh, part two, the Clark genealogy as a connecting thread, because with the advent of the Black Studies movement in the 70s and 80s, we got a lot of institutionally trained thinkers. 
Clark was extremely suspicious of them, not in the least part because of his own upbringing, as, as Earl Thorpe would say, as I'm sure my brother uh, Shabaka, I mean, uh, Shabaka, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm thinking about Shabaka, uh, I'm going to tell you, Hannibal, another general, but in addition to that, Dr. Thompson was saying that uh, they have the mummies, right, the so-called well, Saku in the committee, in the basement in Boston Museum, and he's saying those are the Cushitic kings, and I had to step out for a minute at the end of his uh, question and answer, but I don't know if it was communicated there. So a lot of people who might not have been here last night, but the speculation is that they, was, they could be indeed those Cushitic uh, kings from that alleged 25th dynasty. So we're talking about Shabaka, Pianki, and Taharka in the basement in Boston. So <laughs> how long have those ancestors been watching over us from right up the street? And we talk about them all the time. Shabaka, Taharka, Bianchi came down the Nile and, and the 25th dynasty gave what Dr. Clark said, the last great walk in the sun. And they've been laying not six hours from here, but God knows how long in some cracker's basement. But it's a blessing to know that though they may even be physically on this continent with us even as we speak tonight. Oh, no question. They wouldn't let Obenga, and they got rooms in there, and Obenga's an uh, Egyptologist par excellence. Even the white folks have to say, we don't like you, but you can come, sir. They only let white folks in some of those rooms over there. God knows what they got over there. And they probably have tea somewhere over there, or not in somebody knowing you pin. No question, and, and that's, that's a good point, Jim. Um, but as I was saying, Earl Thorpe uh, would call them, as you communicated to me, as we've discussed, scholars without portfolio. He was always very suspicious of institutionally trained thinkers who didn't take a certain stance. His attitude toward Du Bois was an attitude, of course, of respect because Du Bois took a stance similar to the stance John Henry Clark had. We may have, we'll have to grill everything, but it's clear from your stance what position you take vis-a-vis -vis black people and nation. Because nobody likes you, everybody wants to punish you. And I don't care whether you're communist or anything else, as we see with his relationship with Paul Robeson in the 1960s, particularly the early 60s around Freedom Ways magazine. We see Clark embracing those thinkers, those workers, those activists who engaged in radical nation building, talk and organizing for African people. So, with that in mind, the discussion is divided into uh, several parts. The first I just went through very briefly, the context of a passing. And I put A in brackets because obviously, uh, Clark's passing, I want, to I want to encompass both the context of an individual's passing and the context of passing in a general theoretical sense. What does it mean for someone to make their transition? And what does that mean for those they've left behind? So I kind of talk about some of those issues and we can kind of talk about it afterwards after I finish going through this. Because I, I left a lot out, it's, you know, it's a lot of discussion. And I'm writing it up really because, we, and then this is something that James Stewart brings up in an article he wrote in 1992 on black studies in a little uh, journal that's now not publishing called The Afrocentric Scholar. And he talks about the importance of exemplars. And he says that a lot of our people have engaged in speeches, but many of those speeches should have been committed to paper. And if they've been committed to paper, they could be communicated through other generations and people could sit down and think you know, a lot about a lot of stuff. And so a lot of things, you know, we have to do that. I'm always on Dr. Jeffries about that. All right, this is good now. Let's get it on paper. <laughs> and Dr. Thompson, for that matter, who you got a glimpse last night of what he has. You just tape record, and look, even if we had to record it and send it back to you to edit, get it on paper, because that's very important. Number two, the second section is the Clark genealogy as a connecting thread. I want to talk about modern era African nationalist praxis, uh, theory and practice. Uh, I put modern in quotes because, as we know, modern history is just the history of the rise of Europe and the, and the record of Europe's clash with everybody on the planet. So that goes back about 500 years. That's why I say modern history. What is my modern? Modern history is us versus everybody else. So I may put modern era because we talk about the modern era, but we know what we're talking about. Number three, exemplars and prescriptions. What might be done? I borrowed that phrase, obviously, from uh, V.I. Lennon, what must be done before or contemporary of his, a little bit later, George Washington Woodby, an African preacher who embraced socialism in the late 19th century, talked about what must be done. But I say what might be done because we got to flesh this out. <laughs> but the fleshing out, I want to pull some examples or exemplars from Dr. Clark's life and prescriptions in terms of his work. And I kind of organized it around several themes that I want to explore. So let's move quickly through the genealogy. I've broken up, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sections of his life. 
The first, the early period from 1915 to 1933. The second is his second intellectual period, the period of his real incubation. This is after he moves to New York, 1933 to 1940. The third is his stepping up into the professional, the era of working as a professional historian. And I don't mean professional as licensed by white folks, I mean professional in terms of him coming back from the army, going to come back from the army, and beginning to interrogate America in a dialogue with folk that he hadn't been in a consistent dialogue with before. And that goes from about 41 to 1959 or 60. 60 to 67, the era of radicalization. This is the famous 60s. This is the period, as, as Dr. Uh, Carruthers is often fond of saying, that well, I was a Negro until the students had a city in in North Carolina A&T, and my students are the ones who told me, well, you need to come out of that shirt and tie. And Anderson Thompson would tell you the same thing. It was the era of radicalization, not only for this generation, but also in many ways for John Henry Clark. 1968 to 1983, I kind of tell that, uh, that section Professor John Henry Clark because that's the moment where he becomes a part of the genealogy in a venerated way and becomes part of what we might refer to as the Big Four or the Quadrivium, whatever you want to call it, John Henry Clark, John Jackson, Yosef Ben Yakin, and then Chancellor Williams. This is the period of Professor John Henry Clark and their tours throughout the country and sitting with folks and this, is, this, this gives in terms of prescriptions and what might be done. There are tapes all over this country, not cassette tapes, reel-to-reel -reel tapes all over the country where folk would invite John Jackson and John Clark or John Jackson and Dr. Ben or three of them or Chancellor Williams into their community and they'd stay for a week or two and live in somebody's house and every day they'd talk all day and somebody'd be there with a reel-to-reel -reel tape. And those tapes, some of those tapes exist, a lot of them in the Midwest because I'm more familiar with that area. A brother named Bill and a brother Kansu in Dayton got hours and days of tapes. Harold Pates has a mountain of them. And I'm saying that there are people around the country with tapes like that. I'm quite sure in this city right here, there's somebody with a mountain of books. The destruction of black civilization, the rebirth of African civilization, are not the only two historical works. And if I were white, not the only long essay that Chancellor Williams wrote. The Raven, Have You Been to the River, are probably not the only two novels that he wrote. <laughs> there are books on tape from Chancellor Williams that we can get access to. And this is during that period, 68 to 83, Professor Jane Ricard. 1983 to 1987, the organization of intellectual insurgency. That's important because this period really talks about, if we understand, and here I borrow from the Italian uh, Marxist, Antonio Gramsci, very interesting about white folks. We're very clear on them. They're also very clear about themselves and us. White supremacy, uh, as Dr. Uh, Thompson said last night, White superiority, white supremacy, different things. White supremacy is about raw, naked power, and there's a color hierarchy in white supremacy. The Italians are the niggas of Europe. The Greeks, the Italians, the French, because they're black if we weren't around. They congeal against us, but once it's just them, that doesn't mean white supremacy goes anywhere. It just means that we're not the blackest. Now that does not mean, conversely, that these people are black people, although we see the, the biological linkages. But the reason I bring it up is because Antonio Gramsci and the Italians have a struggle against authority. And in his writings after they locked him up, his so-called prison notebooks, Gramsci talks about the nature of resistance. And he also talks about something called incorporation. And it's very important and very apt because he's critiquing capitalist society and that's what we have to do because this is a late capitalist society. 1983-1987 Dr. Clark's life, I call the organization of intellectual insurgency because this is a period where black studies becomes an institutional concern for universities. Now that may look like a good thing in some dimensions, and it is, but it's also an example of incorporated resistance. Because before this, it was a dirty word in universities. Now it's a multi-million dollar business. How did it move from one thing to the other thing? Well, if we study capitalist societies, we're very clear about what happens. When you resist, a capitalist society will expand its borders to incorporate your resistance so that enough of what you do is reflected in what they do so that you feel a little bit more at ease. So hence we have black studies practice as be as black as you want, say whatever words you want, dress however you want, just come to work tomorrow. And thereby incorporating the resistance. And Jeremy Clark, if nothing else, was a fierce critic of incorporated resistance. 
1988 to 1998, the final decade of his life, the commercialization of Afrocentrism. To me, Afrocentrism and commercialization are almost indistinguishable. <laughs> because that's almost what it means. And that's a whole nother discourse for a whole nother time. But it's very much bracketed by something Dr. Clark said in 1992, right here in Philadelphia at the African Heritage Studies Association. He said, and I quote, I will go immediately to the point. I will let you know exactly who I do not have a fight with. I do not have a fight with Malefi Asante. I have a fight with this generation. This generation has failed to see the latitude and longitude. You know how you love those three words? <laughs> how you would do it when you go. The latitude and the longitude of the subject that was already old when Professor Asante's parents were born. His generation has made a cult around something that is an intellectual exercise that is supposed to be continuously investigated. The jury is always out on intellectual subjects because the investigation is always ongoing. That is the role of scholarship, to take scholarship one step further from where the scholar has found it. My argument is about latitude and longitude. This is the view from the bridge. We haven't kicked what we call Afrocentricity back far enough. We haven't dealt with its historical roots. Its historical roots are as long as the disturbance of African people by foreigners and the pulling of them out of their land. It's John Clark. And that is the reference to the last section, the commercialization of Afrocentrism. So let's quickly go back through the genealogy. Section one, the early period. I want to kind of situate that because uh, James Turner, in a small article he wrote years ago, maybe 1976, and I think it was the Journal of Negro Education, wrote a, or, or a history of black studies, a very small article, that one, three, four pages. But he puts a chronology together of black studies. And he talks about the early period of black studies. And I kind of tweaked it a little bit and expanded and contracted to talk a little bit about periods of black studies. And if we look at 1915 to 1933, of course, Dr. Clark was born, born uh, New Year's Day, 1915. Prior to that, we see the 20th century beginning we see African people enter the so-called European 20th century with this notion of black studies on their mind. As early as 1897, much earlier than that, we can go back through the history if we had to, obviously. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm very conscious of time. I don't want to be here. I don't want to really have a dialogue on this. Um, if I could take maybe two minutes, well, then you take that. Obviously, the different African societies in Africa prior to European colonialism, we see the uh, influence, uh, internal influence, the internal discourse of Africa, so many different cultures. Then the moment of uh, uh, the European incursion and our transportation across the Atlantic into this West Atlantic site where we are, it skewed all of them down the Western Hemisphere. We see a process of essentialization where Africans begin to come together on our commonalities. And that's when we begin to discuss African identity as more than just discrete ethnic groups in Africa, but we see ourselves discussing African identity as a group because we've been forced to. And as we engage in that dialogue, our commentary on that process becomes black studies. We were studying and doing our thing here, but it becomes black studies in a very real sense when we're forced to grapple with the notion of African identity as a pan-African notion. And that's why Dr. Clark says Afrocentricity, he dates it from when we moved. Because that's when it becomes important to talk about the collective center beyond the discrete ethnic groups, which still have cultural unity, but we didn't have to really think about it until we were forced to. With that in mind, we see the early ways of resistance, 15th, 16th, 17th century, the revolts, the Maroons, we see Suriname, we see uh, Brazil, we see the Palmares, we see uh, Jamaica, Haiti. We see another transformation take place in the early, well, the 18th and 19th century, for example, the Haitian Revolution, which is clearly informed by the, the traditions of the ethnic groups that come to Haiti, particularly the Yoruba tradition. We see that in form. We see Bookman, the priest, called down the gods, call down the Orisha, call down the ancestors to help them in this war, and they drive the French out of the island of Haiti with the help of the culture. And of course, as Dr. Carruthers always talks about, the great speech that was given by Dessaline, cast down the image of the white man's God who has brought down your tears for so long, and listen to liberty which speaks in all of our hearts. This is Africa informing the revolution, but it brings us into another transition because around the 1801, 1802, 1803, 1804, we see African people in the United States looking at Haiti less for the religious implications, although in the South we clearly see those traditions very strong, but in places like Philadelphia they look at the Haitian Revolution as an example of liberation and it becomes something else. Still black studies, but they say the Haitians are showing us a way to do this. 
So that 30 years later, or 25 years later, 30 years later, when Nat Turner, Denmark VZ, or Gabriel Prosser 1800, when we see these revolts coming up, Martin Delaney makes it very clear in his novel Blake about what significance that was. They were looking at Haiti saying, we're going to kill these white folks, get a boat, and go to Haiti. Black studies. It becomes this discourse about how we're going to get out of what Dr. Thompson and uh, J.J. Carruth talk about as this mess. This is the 19th century, and I mean, there's so many other things we can talk about, but as we get to the end of the 19th century, we go through this period, particularly by the end of the 19th century, because we're living in the United States, and I'm just really now talking about this, our group here. Knowledge is something that's engaged in as an armchair activity for Europeans. There, there are no universities really. European, your university concept as we know it today really is barred from the Germans. They, Europe has never looked at America as anything except for their bastard child, their stepchild, and they don't think anything over here is original except the stuff that we bring to the table and maybe the Native Americans. Everything else, you see, y'all copying us. It's our music, it's our architecture. The only thing y'all got over there is jazz and whatever them black people are doing. Everything else is a joke. It's borrowed from us. Right? You know, but the university tradition that they borrow is not as good, which is why if you want to go to the best university in the United States, Harvard, Yale, but if you really want to go to the university, you go to Oxford or the Sorbonne, or you go to the University of Berlin, ah, now that's knowledge. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but at that time, black people began to model these exemplars as Americans are building them. So the way we begin to model that, the sources of knowledge began to shift in the earth for up until the late 19th century, ministers in the community didn't go to school to get a degree. Most of them oftentimes were trained in the African traditions as well, and that's how they were able to negotiate with African people. But by the end of the 19th century, the minister profession, the educator profession, as professionalized and dictated by Europe, become very important. Doesn't mean that these people aren't struggling for African liberation, but it does mean that it begins to look a little different. So by 1897, and that gets me through where I wanted to, where I wanted to get to. By 1897, when the American Negro Academy is founded, with uh, Reverend Alexander Crummel being the first president, Du Bois, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, very interesting even as an aside, when they founded the American Negro Academy, Paul Lawrence Dunbar is the one who pushed to have American Negro because Crummel wanted to name it the African Academy. Yeah. If you ever want to read a great tragedy, read the history and the story of Alexander Crummel, right. a brother who gave his life struggling for African people. Spent 20 years in Liberia, didn't just talk about going to Africa, went there as a missionary. Talk about contradictions. Who said, I'm a Christian, these are pagans, but you know what? They are more moral than the people in the church that sent me to them. And struggled for years. He wasn't in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. This guy was, in, was he's a presbyter. No, Episcopalian. By himself almost in the white church. Struggling. One of his uh, great friends, Edward Wilmot Blythe, who was right next door in Liberia, had to run from Liberia and spent his last days in Sierra Leone. Brothers who were there on the ground, grappling. But I, but I bring up Cromel because he came back to the United States, spent his last years here, and as an old man, served to preside over what became known as the American Negro Academy. That, for me, when people talk about black studies and all, you know, in, in, in the professional sense, you can really start talking about it one place with the American Negro Academy. You go back farther than that, but really, the American Negro Academy is a good place to bracket our discussion. Du Bois was a member of the American Negro Academy. If you remember, he was so influenced, here we go to this tradition of Kemet again. He was so influenced by Alexander Cromel, not just what he wrote, but how he looked, how he acted, how he carried himself. Very dignified. A, a very dark-skinned brother with white hair by that time. Very dignified, suit and tie, always about the book. We must be clear. Went to Cambridge, they treated him like dirt. Learned his Greek and Latin. One of the most accomplished scholars of his century, always down by everybody, but very clear. And Du Bois looked at him as a young man in his 20s and said, this is my model. And that's why when you read The Souls of Black Folk, there's a chapter in that book on Alexander Cromer. Right. And when you read it, you're not just reading one scholar talking about another scholar. You're reading a son yeah. writing about his father. Because you don't write like that about a past something you ain't interested in. He said, I can see him laboring over his desk at night, preparing sermons that no one will listen to. <laughs> this is Du Bois. So when you see Du Bois' as old man, and you see him standing by himself, took his passport, moved it, and you say, why isn't he moved? He said, well, that's because 65 years ago, I knew Alexander Cromel, and I watched that brother. This is the genealogy. 
So as we continue, and I, and I don't mean, let me, let me stop here and put a, a, a stick in it because I, I don't want to disrespect the sisters. Because what I'm saying is there were women on the scene as well. People like Anna Julia Cooper, who was another towering intellectual figure who has been ignored. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, and before her, Mariah Stewart. There are apprentice traditions. These, these are contemporaries of each other. You can't talk about Frederick Douglass without Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, who we commonly don't think of, perhaps, in the sense of being an intellectual, but clearly an intellectual. A woman who was so apprenticed in the traditions of Africa that she, people say, well, how can she disguise herself? He says, because y'all haven't studied Africa. <laughs> what do you mean, how she could, how could she disguise? See, y'all thinking about somebody putting a wig on or a beard. You ain't thinking about somebody that maybe prayed to something or had something or had a root or did something or consulted somebody. In fact, you have no idea about how somebody could walk through a town and nobody recognize them with a $10,000 bounty on their head. That's because you're looking at her as Harriet Tubman. Maybe we find out what her other names were. We'll find out how she did what she did. Clearly intellectual work. This is black studies. This is what we're talking about. And this is what Johnny Clark talked about. So, as we continue, as we get to 1915, Du Bois has been on the scene for a little while, and the BACP and stuff has been founded. Pan-African Congress takes place. Henry Sylvester Williams has had a couple, 1900 being the one that we talk about generally in terms of the first Pan-African Congress. But by 1915, Clark comes on the scene. 1915 is a very important moment, not only in, uh, obviously, Clark is born, but we see the globalization of American identity. It's very important. American exceptionalism is set in stone beginning in the 19th century, but really comes to fruition in the 20th, the early 20th century. By 1915, America has a global empire. They've taken the Philippines from Spain, Spanish-American War, from 1897, 1898, 1899, where they blow up one of their own ships to get the population to go for the fight. Remember the main. In Cuba, in the harbor, they, they, how did the ship blow up? Nobody knows. You mean nobody knows? How do you get people to go to war? You got to give them some symbols. Remember the Alamo. Remember the Maine. Desert Storm. You got to get the population prepped. Remember what Noam Chomsky says: the mass media has two functions. One is to create uh, manufacture consent. You got to get people to agree. And the second is to create necessary illusions, which is why most people are at home right now preparing to watch Randy Moss play football tonight because somebody's got to care who got 28 and who got 14 because that's a necessary illusion. It's a function of the mass media, but. By the beginning of the, 19, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, what you see is American exceptionalism becomes global. They've got the Philippines now. They've got Puerto Rico. They're going into other lands. They're coming into Haiti. Rayford Logan, who we remember for his book, The Betrayal of the Negro, wrote his PhD dissertation on the American occupation of Haiti and talks about how they're beginning to go out. And as they go out, technology's getting better. Film, telegraph, Communication and the symbols are being sent out over the airways. 1915 puts a very good stick in that with what? Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation, based on a stage play, based on a book. We see technology and the popular imagination moving through technology and reaching wider and wider groups. It's a movie, which means everybody can see what niggas do. They take off their shoes and eat fried chicken in the uh, legislature and vote about how to have a holiday. Before that, it was a stage play which took it because they didn't have movies. And before that, it was the book by Thomas Dixon, The Klansman, which was very popular. But as the culture becomes less literate and responds more to moving images, the same image just moved into a different venue. So we see 1915, and of course, we see the opposition to Birth of a Nation, Monroe Trotter in Boston, here in Philadelphia, shutting it down. You're not going to show that movie here. We see black resistance. Now we run to the movie theater to see ourselves denigrated, from Chris Wallace to Beloved to everything in between. We run to the movie to get Enemy of the State. Anyway, as we continue, we see the deaths in 1915 of Booker T. Washington and Henry Vanille Turner. Of course, Booker T. Washington, we see the Wizard of Tuskegee has a, a lot of different faces, some of which are very ugly to us, <laughs> others which will appeal to us. But one thing we do see is about 1915, he and Emma J. Scott and others were organizing to capitalize a film to go against Birth of a Nation called Birth of a Race. And they were going to start their own movie company. The Wizard Dies in 1915. They make a film, it's not like the film they're going to make, but if you can imagine at the beginning of motion pictures, before Harry Warner, before the large movie theaters, before Warner Brothers, before uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, before Sam Goldwyn, before, as Neil Gabler says in his book, the Jews invented Hollywood. If you can imagine on the ground floor, Booker T. Washington, with the institution he had, training filmmakers at Tuskegee, 
then you can get a sense of perhaps how much further along in this struggle we might have been had he not died in 1915. Very important. And of course, 1915 begins the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Carter G. Woods worked in a coal mine in Virginia until he was 20 years old. Then he went to high school. <laughs> not unlike Benjamin E. Mays, who did the same thing in the field of South Carolina until he was 22. And then finished high school. Carter G. Woodson never forgot. This is the exemplar. This is, and I'm bringing this up because this is what influenced John Henry Clark. These are the individuals that we listen to his speeches and read his books he refers to over and over and over again. Not just because he read their stuff, but because people who trained him saw those people as his exemplars and infused in him this narrative. So as we see, we see Woodson coming up and never forgetting saying, my job is to make history accessible to everybody. I'm not going to go teach at this, I'm not going to, I went to the University of Chicago, I'm not teaching there. I'm going to start an organization where school kids can get black history. I'm going to create study guides that I don't write. My study guides will be written by classroom teachers who teach kids all over the South. I'm going to start the Journal of Negro History so we can print our documents. Forget what I say, let's just print the documents. And I'm also going to start the Negro History Bulletin. Why? Because these school teachers need a place to publish their opinions of black children. And here we're talking about multiculturalism, culture and infusion. We have the examples in our historical record. The Association for the Study of Negro Life and History has been unequal in what Carter G. Woodson did. And if you go back and read the Negro History Bulletin, we want to find the black women in history. All these people sitting here at the University of Pennsylvania talking about, oh, black women have been silenced, the voice men silenced. Okay, go back from volume one, number one of the Journal of Negro, uh, the Negro History Bulletin to today, because it's still publishing. Count up the number of women you read. Who's teaching these kids? It's black women in the South. They're writing article after article after article. My experience my third grade class, my sixth grade class, my kindergarten. This is what I'm doing here. This is the black history kit. This is what the kid, this is the essays the kids wrote on Dessalines. So this is the kids wrote on Paul Robeson. This is what the kids wrote on uh, Harriet Tubman. Years from the 20s all the way up to 1998. So we see, 1915, the organization starts. 1916, Marcus Garvey comes to the United States. Looking for Booker T. Washington, who died a year before. General Negro history is found in 1916. 1917, yeah, I got, I got to speed this up. 17, Hubert Henry Harrison publishes his book, The Negro and the Nation. Very important, Hubert Harrison, another figure who's very much neglected from the Danish West Indies. Born April 27. See, Garvey was 1887? Garvey was 1887. 1887. That means Hubert Harrison was 1883. That's it, 1883. Once again, if you want to read about him, World's Great Men of Color, Volume 2. There's an article on Hubert Henry Harrison written by J.A. Rogers, the Jamaican. Why does J.A. Rogers write about him? Read that article. That's not an article of one scholar writing about another scholar. That's an article of a little brother writing about his big brother. Because he starts the article off as why must some of so men, some men always be up and others be down? Why do some people have such a hard road in life and, and, and others are just venerated? Right? And he's talking about Hubert Henry Harrison, who died in relative obscurity and poverty. The man who was called by John Jackson the Black Socrates. Why do they call him the Black Socrates? Particularly when some people say Socrates himself was black. Well, the notion was at that moment, this was the smartest guy we had. That's right. Four corners of knots. We're talking about a guy who could hold his own on so many topics it wasn't even funny. It's not anecdotal. This is a man who would lecture and the students from Columbia would come. I got to sit and listen to Hubert Henry Harrison on everything. We don't care. What is he talking about? Where is he going to be? And, they, and he didn't have a degree. They had to come. So we see white folks come get knowledge. We're, we're talking about that last. White folks get knowledge. When they want knowledge, they come to you. They don't care what they have. So, but at any rate, why does Rogers write about him? Because they're brothers. And this brother passed off the scene, died early. There's some people say they killed him at the Harlem Hospital. It's in the Amsterdam News. You go back and read maybe 1927. Talk about he went in for an Operation Appendix and died. <laughs> Came out dead. And like, what happened? They murdered Hubert Henry Harrison. But before he died, passed off the scene. Remember, John Clark didn't get to New York until 1933, but John Jackson from South Carolina gets there a little earlier. Before Harrison dies, he takes as one of his students, John G. Jackson. John G. Jackson was John Henry Clark's sponsor in the Harlem History Club. There's a reason why John Henry Clark wrote the introduction to Black Classic Press, the latest reprint of When Africa Awakes, which is Hubert Harrison's book. 
because he knew the significance of, of Hubert Henry Harrison from John Jackson. There's a reason why John Henry Clark wrote the introduction to J.A. Rogers' World's Great Men of Color. It's more than this is an important book need to be in print. This is what I read when I came to New York. This is the brother I knew. These are the people who brought me in. And that still holds true today. You wonder why people write prefaces to other people's books? You gotta go look behind it, because some people write prefaces to garbage. And you wonder, why would they put their name on it? Look at the relationship here. And you don't just put your name on anything. As a matter of fact, I hate to bring it up, but I'll bring it up in a second. That's why we still read in Church Ward and Gerald Massey. Because of him. And because of the single most influential study group in the history of the Nazis movement, the Hall of YMCA History Club. If it weren't for the Blinding Society, we wouldn't be talking about Edward, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Albert Church Ward, Gerald Massey. We wouldn't be talking about Godfrey Higgins and Anacalypsis, drawing back the, society, uh, the, the, the veil of, of ISIS and talking about the Indian contribution. Important books, but a lot of work's been done since then. Why do we focus on them? It's an amazing thing we start unpacking. So as we see, I, I'm going to have to hurry up. Uh, 1931, 1932, Schomburg is at Fisk. Why is that important? Well, well, okay, let me, let me do something. 1927, Garvey's deported. Hubert Henry Harrison dies. Schomburg's collection is still private. 19, um, 20, well, 1925, I have to say that. Why? Because John McCarr is 10 years old. The New Negro was published in 1925. In that, art, in that book, of course, is Dr. Schomburg, Professor Schomburg's article, The Negro Digs Up His Past. Arthur Schomburg, Puerto Rico, spent his early days in the Puerto Rican Liberation Movement. Not only in Puerto Rico, but when he moved to New York, here. Raymond Bitasis, the whole Puerto Rican Liberation Movement. Right here in Philadelphia is a huge contingent, as Aisha was informing me, of folk who are very clear about what their link is to Arthur Schomburg, or Arturo Schomburg. Latino, very clear about that. When Arthur Schomburg came to the United States, he loved Puerto Rico. When he came here, he's some black. So they can embrace him. But let's be very clear about the history of Arthur Schomburg. You look at Eleanor uh, de Verney Sinet's book, Schomburg. Hit her biography of Arthur Schomburg with all the documents. It's very clear what Arthur Schomburg came down. He joined the Masons and everything else he could get up. And he spent his life in a dialogue with folks who always thought that he knew a lot, but he wasn't quite respectable because he didn't have degrees. Another scholar without portfolio. Remember Clark's suspicion of institutionally trained thinkers. They never respected Arthur Schomburg. Du Bois said, I can't let this man be the president of the American Negro Academy. Remember now, his father founded the American Negro Academy. Schomburg, by the, by the time Schomburg became the president, remember, of course, people were saying, ah, it's irrelevant. We can't get enough people in it. We can't get, so they let Schomburg handle it. And he became the president. Schomburg took that very seriously. That's a step up. Yeah, you know, y'all respect me. Some people say, yeah, nigga collects books. You, you can't get around him. I mean, if you're looking for the book, you got to go to Schomburg and his buddies. Henry Slaughter there in D.C., the man who married and his wife wanted to divorce him because she sent him out to get a hat and he came back with books with the money he was supposed to spend for hats and she threw the uh, books at him to tell him, get the hell out of here. This is the bibliophile's life. Robert Mara Adger, right down on South Street, they got the marker up for Adger, but how many people know? Hey, from personal experience, you know what it is. When you got choice between a book and some, um, and some food and you take the book, Sometimes it's the price you pay, particularly if you got a family, a husband, a wife, and kids. Schomburg paid. The people who were in his group paid, because he said that they were still in our thunder when uh, John, uh, when they started the Association for Study of Negro Life History in 1915, because two years before that, three years before that, 1912, they started, no, 1911, they started the Yonkers Society for Historical Research in Yonkers, New York. These are the scholars without portfolio. John Edward Bruce, so-called Bruce Grip, used to be, was enslaved. Cat ended up writing for the Negro World, one of the greatest journalists ever produced, along with Timothy Thomas Fortune, Ida B. Wells, and others. Woodson took off with his, they couldn't get their started. But anyway, when they make Schomburg the president of the American Negro Academy, that's a step up, that's a credential. And at the same time, saying this thing is dead. 1920, 1921. Okay, 1925, Elaine Locke, who was always friends with Schomburg, but who would write to his other friends, this fellow Schomburg sure knows a lot, but he can't write worth a damn. He's writing Puerto Rican English. And we're trying to edit Schomburg's papers because Elaine Locke was a Rhodes Scholar. <laughs> so he's trying to edit Schomburg's papers for him to get the stuff that he knows out of his head and on the paper and writing his other people. Not dogging Schomburg, just saying, ah, oh, the guy's not polished. You know? But anyway, 
So one of the articles he includes in the New Negro is Schomburg's article, The Negro Digs Up His Past, and a kid from Georgia when a visiting lecturer comes through town, lecturer comes through town, glimpses this article, John Henry Clark. And one of the things he does when he leaves the South, heads to Chicago for the World's Fair, but ends up in New York, is going to look for the guy who wrote this article. Something in the article resonated in him. The Negro digs up his past. By the way, Arthur Schomburg, of course, contributes to the history of black studies. He wrote a, a small pamphlet called Racial Integrity, the call for black studies. And he talks about laying out a plan for black studies. See, it, it's real funny when people start talking about, I'm the first, or I found it, I did. And you, no, 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 no. We must deal with genealogy. Because this is beyond, hey, it's all cool. We can all be friends. We all need to be together. We African people. But at the same time, if we disrespect our genealogy, we lose our compass. We lose our view from the bridge. We don't have any kind of view then. And then, it's, then, then the next person comes up, 20 years, I'm the first. And well, since we ain't got no historical account, you might as well be. And then we write where white folks are. Because everybody becomes the first. Tomorrow they have another first. So at any rate, 28, 27, garbage deported, Hubert Harrison dies, 1928, Schomburg's collection is acquired by the New York Public Library. 1929, star market crashes, and you know what that means. White America catches a cold, black people catch pneumonia. It's really hard times for black people. 31 and 32, Schomburg is at Fisk, because he got to pay the bills. He goes to Fisk as a librarian. They dog him kind of down there, and he comes back to New York. 1933, Clark arrives in New York City. Oh, wait, one, one, one other thing. The year before, remember, Roosevelt's elected. Roosevelt's elected. Why is that important to us at this moment? Because Roosevelt's elected, and part of his New Deal programs is the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Many of those programs are the reasons why we have discourse today around some of the historical narratives. That's where they collected those narratives now, remembering slavery. They're going to make a whole bunch of money over the same WPA narratives they've been publishing year after year. It's in the book Remembering Slavery. It's in the book Bullwhip Days. The same narratives they keep with George Rawick edited the whole thing and published them in volumes. But now, uh, Ira Berlin and whoever else and his cohorts and Robin Kelly are going to put together a tape with a few of the interviews and black actors uh, sound like they're in blackface. Well, I told him it's then you listen to the actual interviews, they don't sound nothing like that. They sound like black people talking about the people that they struggled against. Remembering slavery. Well, that's when they were collected in the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. And of course, all, all, many of us have, uh, have uh, familiarity with WPA, but 1932 marks the election of, uh, of Roosevelt. Clark arrives in New York City in 1933, a lot quicker than what I'm doing now. 1933-1940, second intellectual period, the incubation period. 1934, that's when Clark enters the Harlem History Club. Sponsored by John Jackson, the leader of that group, Willis N. Huggins. The first African person to get a doctorate of philosophy from Fordham University. Serious scholar. First black person to lecture, hired by the New York City Board of Education to lecture in social studies. Clear, cut above, Willis N. Huggins, public school teacher with a PhD. White folks stumbling off the boat, barely speaking good English. Y'all seen The Godfather? What's your name? Oh, where you from? Corleone. <laughs> All right. Corleone comes in. He's running things after a while. All these immigrants coming in off the boat, doing whatever, saying whatever. A generation later, Corleone's children, you know, hey, you can go be a public school teacher. You living in New York, got all different ethnic groups. This cat had a PhD from Fordham, and he's teaching in the public school. But he's also organizing. He talks about, in the Harlem History Club, it's the YMCA, right around there, 135th Street, this while this is going on. Sean Burr's collection's there, the Branch Library, the New York Public Library is there, that's where they donated it and put it there, it's on upstairs at the library, where when Clark went up the scene. Right down the street's the Harlem YMCA, where the little theater, they're meeting in the basement, if you go there right now, it's there. We got sites all over the country, we can turn into holy sites, take pilgrimages, New York, go to the little theater, I've been up there myself. When they went looking, I, you know, Chip a little piece of wood off the thing. I kept, have been carrying that wood for about eight years in a little vial. <laughs> That's my sacred totem. You know, I'm making a confession now, but you know, I figured they may tear the building down. I'm not going to let them do that. Langston Hughes stated when he first came to New York. Of course, Clark's house is right. Remember at the funeral, they had a processional right past. He, he didn't move. Internationally known, going all over, but look at that incubator. Never moves from that rock. Where as a kid, this is where I came. Never moved away from there. No matter where he went, always comes back to this. So we see, important the Harlem History Club. We know Nkrumah visited there, Francis Nkrumah, when he was in school. Nanam Diazigwe, Zeke of Africa, who just died a couple of years ago. Of course, we know Zigwe and Nkrumah. Took classes at European, went to Lincoln, 
back and forth in New York. Francis and Krum are going to be a divinity student. You know, Clark tells a story about how they used to argue back and forth. Africa don't need no more ministers, this kind of thing. In the Harlem History Club. And they learned pedagogy from Willis Hutton. They had to memorize, they had to write plays about historical figures and memorize the play. And if John Clark was sitting here right now, you asked him to give you a line from those plays, he could sit here and recite that line. Seen him do it many times. Talk about when the Coptic Church pulled out of Egypt. We we'll go back to the history, early history of Christianity, the whole conflict between Arius and Athanasius, the whole thing where they had to, where uh, Constantine calls the conference and they pick what books going in, what books going out, and Ethiopians are like, man, y'all crazy. <laughs> and after a while, the Coptic Church pulls out of this thing, y'all, uh-uh. Clark wrote a play about it. He can sit here and recite to you the speech from the letter, resigning the Coptic Church. Because in the Harlem History Club, that's what you had to do. That was your training. You <laughs> right, these So they were training in how people say, well, how can he sit there and know all this stuff? It's training. That's how you learn. Now, you know, a couple of overheads, puff, puff, bam. And it's like, in a minute, it's like, okay, that's, wow. Okay. The question to answer is when you find out what people know. <laughs> it's like, I heard a speech, but I gotta ask you a question. I was reading such and such a book, and then they start downloading. That's what Jeremy Clark, that was the, you can see a rhythm, a different rhythm then. Because then you get a chance to do an interface on a different thing. So anyway, all right. Not only were they reading and studying, they were working. But remember, 1935, the Italian-Ethiopian War takes place. The Italian-Ethiopian War means, hey, here's Ethiopia. Obviously, they beat the Italians, as Dr. Thomas said last night, the Battle of Ottawa in 1897. They drive them back. Mussolini's not satisfied, as, Clark, uh, as Du Bois writes in 1915 in an article in the Atlantic Monthly, The African Roots of the War, he says what Dr. Thompson said last night, which is Africa is being carved up by Europeans, and really World War I is all about they taking the fight out the back room and bringing it in the living room, because the back room's Africa. Now they're going to bring it in their house and settle it. But the point I'm trying to make is, 1935, the interwar years, Hitler's amassing what he's going to do. Mussolini's trying to get his global empire together, because they're getting ready to go for another backroom brawl. Ethiopia, he decides, has been, you know, even trying to get them down for a long time. So they go in. Now the conflict, however, there's something on the scene that wasn't the scene in 1897 like it, like it is in, in 1935. Technology's better. News reels. <laughs> News reels, these people on horses and these planes and the Pope blessing planes. Black people in America are fired up. In New York, lines stretching down the block of black people in America trying to sign up to fight for the Ethiopian army. Where in the hell did they get that idea? Let's look at the Spanish Civil War. Because America was letting people go and fight in the Spanish Civil War. Paul Robeson went over and sang to those troops. So the black people said, well, hell, if you can go fight for Spain, I can go fight for Abyssinia. <laughs> One was named Abyssinian Baptist Church. <laughs> That's because Ethiopia has always had this image in the mind of black people. I'm going to go fight for Ethiopia. Clark is in the middle of that in the Harlem History Club. Why? Because the Harlem History Club sends Willis Huggins to Geneva to monitor the negotiations about what's going on in Ethiopia. J.A. E. Rogers, who also lectures before the club, goes to Ethiopia. When you read the Pittsburgh Courier, you're reading the correspondence of somebody who was sent there by money raised in part by the Harlem History Club. You got to go report. We got to get some lens on what's going on. How many people do we have today in Somalia? Hell, what is George Kurt? What is Emerge Magazine? Where is Emerge's correspondence in Nigeria? To talk about really what's going on, so I ain't got to read the New York Times every day about uh, 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 Congo, Kinshasa, and Lauren Kabila. Okay, you got guts. I'm sorry. I'm not a journalist anymore. Well, you go do it. No, hell no. I ain't going to go do it. You make a lot of money. Everybody subscribe to Emerge. Where's our correspondent in Kinshasa? Hell, if, 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 if Jane Rogers can duck bullets in 1935, I know damn well you can send somebody over there to either Kinshasa or go to the east. <laughs> go 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 to the to the rebel so-called rebel capital and find out what's going on kissing Ghani, wherever you gotta go. We need some correspondence, bro. And plus now they got cell phones and everything else. You ain't got to really be too. Back then he's writing on a pen and paper. So we see the the, the, the influence of, of, of this. So they come back radicalized, they talk about this pan-African identity. Very important. 1936. Very important marker. Now I'm talking about a young John Henry Clark taking this in and going to a group where they talk about this, study group. There's no accident that ASCAC's found around study groups. We, we know who the family members were. <laughs> it's very important. We see they're coming back talking about this. 1936, they're talking about something else. What happens, of course, the Olympics are held in Germany. Jesse Owens shows 
black people's behind the entire white world and says, please put lip here, 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 and here, but don't take too much time because I got another of four gold medals to win. Hitler is incensed, but what does that mean? Owens is an exemplar for American exceptionalism. It's very important to interrogate what Jesse Owens means, not only in the African imagination, but the American imagination. Jesse Owens is clean cut. And I went to Ohio State, so I'm going to tell you now, Jesse Owens could not live on campus at Ohio State at the time he was winning these medals. He had to live on the other side of Columbus and run, walk, whatever he had to do to get to school because they wouldn't even let him live on campus. But his symbol was, he's humble, he'll take it, Y'all know how they dog Jesse Owens. Had to run against horses when he came back. When they did the thing in 1968, Harry Edwards and all them, the brothers and sisters in Mexico City, they sent Jesse Owens in to tell him to calm down. And they, and, they, and they put old against young in our genealogy. But Jesse Owens, 1936, is a hope for black people, but he's a clear embodiment of American exceptionalism as well, and he's somebody white people can begin to embrace as a symbol against Nazism, much in the way that they did Joe Lewis a little bit later, in a way that they could never do with Jack Johnson. Because Jack Johnson was contrary. Charles Barkley's not a bad boy. I never condone going with white women, but when you do it as a public spectacle and embarrass the entire white world, so they pass white slavery laws because of Jack Johnson. White women follow him from fight to fight. I ain't got to do with them white women. I'll take one or two, but I don't know the rest of the rest of them. You, hey, you're transporting minors across state. I ain't got nothing to do. They hated Jack Johnson. Six, four, blue, black, bald headed, hated Jack Johnson. Charles Barley and the rest of them with Mike Tyson, it's a joke. Don't, don't talk about yourself as being persecuted. You go back to the reason why they came up with the phrase, the great white oak. We got to find somebody that can kick this nigga. That he's killing us. He kissing white women, getting in the ring, pap, and then taking two away and laughing the whole time. Jesse Owens is a godsend because he becomes a symbol for American exceptionalism in a time when the United States is carving out its stage in the world. So they sent him against the Germans. And he wins. Black people are happy, white people are happy too. Joe Lewis comes along, black people are happy, white people are happy too. Jackie Robinson comes along, black people are happy, white people are happy too. I mean, economically, it destroyed the Negro Leagues. This is also why, as we get a little bit later, we'll see, Muhammad Ali becomes such a significant moment. It's a cultural moment. Because Muhammad Ali stops the string of the acceptable American exceptions. Which is another reason why he is so celebrated and venerated today, because it took them a long time. But they could not allow a symbol like that to continue to exist. Remember I said about resistance and incorporation. If we have to wait 30 years until you're sick, we have to show the symbol of the defeated, defiant one. So we give you this Olympic torch and let you light it with shook hands, not because we love you, because we want everybody to see it. See, niggas? You, you niggas can't outrun us. So anyway, we continue. 1937, Huggins and Jackson from the Harlem History Club create their book, The Introduction to African Civilization. It continues in the tradition of black studies textbooks, and there are a number from earlier in 19th, 18th century. Uh, J.W.C. Pennington, William Wells Brown, George Washington Williams write some, but they're talking about creating institutional black studies in 1937. And they ain't just writing theory, they go send a rep, they send a survey out to all the black colleges. What are your classes dealing with Africa? What are your classes dealing with black people? What are your classes? In 1937, they not lecturing before white audiences, they not talking about the innovative ways they can do it. No, they're going out and polling black people, same way that Carter G. Woodson did. What do you bring to the table? And how can we organize it so that everybody can see what you're doing? In a sense of best practices. So, as we continue, we see during that period, 1937, Clark delivers a lecture before the Harlem History Club entitled, An Inquiry into the Racial Identity of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Remember, John Jackson, a little earlier, poses the question in an earlier lecture that Clark missed because he had to work that day. Was Jesus Christ a Negro? They interrogate Christianity in the 30s. So Clark writes his paper, no doubt influenced by his bigger brother, John Jackson, and from that day to, to, to we're sitting right here right now, all of us can think about John Henry Clark and his perspective on Christianity. The early training and the seeds. Very important. Chancellor Williams gets his PhD, 1945, American University, does a dissertation on storefront churches. Why? Because from South Carolina, he grew up in the Christian tradition. And his first book was a novel, 1951. 
have you been to the river? Writing about storefront churches and black priests. If you read it, you realize Ralph Ellison is not original in an invisible man. Chancellor Williams has the black church down stone cold. Very hard to get a copy of that book. You pen has a copy. Johnny McClark had a copy, obviously, which he donated to Woodruff Library in Atlanta, and that's where my copy came from because I stood there and photocopied it. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is somebody could do a very good paper on the fiction of Chancellor Williams. He wrote three novels. <laughs> Once again, though, why do we key in on the destruction of black civilization? Same reason we key in on John Jackson's introduction to African civilization. Who told us the books we should read? And in the Q&A on those real-to-real -real tapes, we got to go get back all the rest of the books. That's why we're still reading Flora Shaw Lugard, A Tropical Dependency. Lady Lugard, A Tropical Dependency, because that's what they read at the Harlem History Club. What kind of study guide is so powerful that 60 years later, we still reprinting the same books? Flora Lugard, it's a heck of a historical piece. But at the same time, it's a lot been written on Nigeria since Flora Shaw Lugard wrote that book in the 20s. Lord Lugard, her husband, is the one who came up with the concept of dual mandate in tropical Africa. Wrote a whole book on it. This is how we should govern African colonialism. We should allow them to have indigenous governance structures there and we'll just supervise. Lord Lugard is the one set it up in British West Africa. His wife writes a book on tropical dependency. It's on the reading list for the Harlem History Club. That's why we reprint that book and read that book instead of expanding that circle to include what her husband wrote. Because what her husband wrote is what set the governmental structure up in West Africa. It's amazing the impact one individual can have on a whole lot of other individuals. So we continue, quickly. Um, I'll bring it up to the third period. Uh, 1938, Schomburg dies. So this is not a very wide period. He knows Schomburg, but the influence is there. 1940, Willis Huggin dies. Some people say suicide. He jumped off George Washington Bridge. Other people said he was murdered. Bottom line, this, this hit Clark significantly. After reading about Huggins, reading Huggins, I went back and asked Dr. Clark, Dr. Clark, Tell me about Willis Huggins. And there were moments that Clark talked about certain things, you, could, you know, even though he had lost his sight and was losing his sight, lost his sight, you could see him tear up. He never got over the death of Willis Huggins because he never solved the crime. This is a young man, PhD, gave his life to building institutions in a black community. And he dies and the police act like, can you imagine how any of us would feel? You lose somebody close to you, the police say, we don't give a damn, that nigga probably killed himself. This man, this man, and, and, and you argue, you know, I mean, what if it was not to be? And they found him dead somewhere. And we went to the police and they laughed. we never forget that. We were ready to go to war. This was Willis Huggins to them. 1940. And then he lost Schomburg two years before that in June. Huggins died in October. This brackets Clark's early intellectual development because what 1941 he goes to the army. He goes to the army in 1941. I regret, one of the questions I regret is, why did you go to the army? I'm hoping Barbara Adams asking that question or somebody on some of them tapes asked. I'm quite sure because we all want to know the same things. I want to know why. What if he said, I went to the army because after Huggins died, I'm like, man, I got to have some order. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about, you know, any number of things. But I mean, because these are parallels. These are exemplars. So we continue. 1941, he's in the army. He's in the army four years, six months, and 24 days. Why? Because you know how folks do when they spend time in jail. They can tell you the, day, the year, the month, and the day. Clark comes out of the army with two significant things. One is an appreciation of how this country's culture is expanding, how it works in terms of its militaristic thing. He understands now the expanding nature of this European imperial structure. He worked for the army. Second thing he comes out with, though, is very interesting. He came out in the film, Jeremy Clark, Great and Mighty Walk. How much time do you have? I'm asking y'all. Are we all right? Okay, I, I, I'm going to try to speed along. What else comes out, though? Remember what he says and even in the film, in the interview, about his men. He took good care of his men. He said, his men asked for anything, he took good care of it. He said, well, well I couldn't shoot, <laughs> oh, but I was a good clerk. Anything they needed, I provided it for them. He has authority, but it's an authority of service. What does Dr. Clark always say when he hear, Dr. Clark, what about Christianity? What about, you know, what do you always say? Service is the highest form of prayer. That's right. <laughs> you got to make it work for us. It's one thing to pray, service is the highest form of prayer. You see the early incubation of this. Research assignments from Schomburg, working with the Harlem History Club, goes in the army and becomes an ordering clerk. But his men come to trust him and value him, front for him, protect him. Why? Because he takes good care of them. 
The second thing comes out of the army with clearly is a better understanding of the needs, desires of the common black person. This is a very good grounding. Some people say, oh, you was in the army, you fought for the white man. Yeah, but well, hold on, wait a minute, hold on. There's a lot of things you learn in areas where you're forced to come together and build community. You learn what works, what doesn't work, and all that old BS be aside, we got to get through this next day. <laughs> so what do we need? Very pragmatic education. Some people spend their whole lives in the academy or some other cloistered place and will sit and pronounce about what needs to be done. You should listen to people who had to do it. Experience the best teacher, right? Okay. Now, 1945, he's discharged from the U.S. Army. 1945-46. For the next six, five or six years, he, 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 he says that I'll pick up my academic career. This may even be in Barbara's book. It might also be in... Um, Oh, uh, My Life in Search of Africa, which the Cornell University Af Institute for African Studies published, which was a series of lectures he gave about his life as well. He's talked about his life a number of different places. In New Dimensions in African History, he's got a, a little section there. You know, you pick it up different places. And then whenever he's talking, as I'll talk about in a second, he always brings personal anecdotes in. So he's left the autobiography, literally. I don't think anybody's really written anything that's biographical in the sense they're writing about him. He, he said enough about himself for us to go through and pick it out. And we get those tapes. We can probably fill in all the gaps, not only about him, but but uh, other people as well. All right, 1945 uh, through 46. That's when he joins the Harlem Writers Guild. That's when he's back in New York dealing with these communists and these socialists. And remember at the funeral, Percy Sutton got up and said, people don't want to deal with Jeremy Clark's socialism, his radicalism, his communism. No, it's not that we don't want to deal with it, Percy. I think maybe one of the things we really haven't interrogated it. Because there was a lot of black socialists running around. You read Mark Nason's book, Black Communists in Harlem During the Depression. You read any of the number of books that were, even Wilson Record, who wrote a couple of books on black communism, race and radicalism. He wrote another, I can't remember, Negro and the Communist Party. You see the black people was all over. Remember the Scottsboro Boys? George Padmore, that's right. Hubert Henry Harrison, socialist, early, called himself a socialist, but he said, I'm doing black stuff. You socialists be damned <laughs> if it comes before race. Race first. Marcus Garvey, race first. Go look at Hubert Henry Harrison who Garvey wanted to be the first president of the African University Garvey was going to found. Hubert Harrison, I'm telling you, and of course we see the West, uh, the, the Caribbean thing, they all from the Caribbean. Africa Yep, when Africa Awakes, he talks about it, Hubert Henry Harrison, that's right. Garvey, Jamaica, Harrison, West Indies, at home maybe they fight. Here, they all together Caribbean. Except you got some other brothers from the islands, Chandler Owen, Chandler, Chandler Owen A. Philip Randolph and them who maybe can't get along with them, or Silk River, the African Brother Brotherhood, they mix it up. But we do see them, and there's an excellent book that's just been written on it by Winston James called Holding Aloft the Banner of Ethiopia. He does a whole history of the Caribbean radicals in the 20th century, beginning in that situation. He does a whole, whole, whole chapter on Hubert Henry Harrison. It's amazing now because scholars are writing about people who we've known about for years. He's been telling us for years about Hubert Henry Harrison. Now somebody who ain't in no organizations ain't doing nothing going to get tenure off a book writing on the black nationalist tradition. We can't allow that to happen. You know, if they're going to do it, we can't stop them. We, we need to tell our own story. So anyway, as we continue, we see um, he's in the Harlem Riots Guild. He's dealing with the communists and the socialists. He begins his studies in African history in earnest. He's been studying because ever since uh, Schauberg, right? But in 1950... So when Clark begins attending meetings of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. Remember I say he comes back to the Army, he starts getting involved in some of these quote-unquote professional organizations. At that time, the Association was the place to be. Uh, oh, you're right. 1950, we see the death of Carter G. Woodson. They always call that the big, the big, the big death uh, day. Char Carter G. Woodson, Charles Hamilton Houston, who there would be no third grade marshal. Charles Hamilton Houston was the dean of the law school at Howard University. He trained everybody who came up out of there. And if Charles Hamilton Houston had been a hold of the Brown versus Board of Education, maybe we wouldn't have been as big as tr trouble as we are now. He's stone integrationist now, but a brilliant legal mind. And Thurgood Marshall would tell you, you think I'm little. Charles Hamilton Houston is the man, died in 1915. Charles Drew also, 1950, 1950, died. Woodson comes off the scene, but Woodson's people are still there. And if you wanted to get a sense of Carter G. Woodson, Brian and I were talking yesterday, you want to get a sense of Carter G. Woodson, the man, Jackie Goggins' book, Carter G. Woodson, A Life in Black History gives you some of the names and dates. But Lorenzo Green left some diaries. As a young scholar, he worked with Carter G. Woodson. The first volume was Working with Carter G. Woodson, The Father of Black History. The second volume was entitled uh, Selling Black History. Because the thing that they, they worked for the association, the association ain't got no money. But they weren't stupid, they had economic plans. 
Robinson started a publishing house because he said black people need to publish our own books about our own history. There can't be no old pissing hand books that just writing about black. Everybody was black. No, that's ridiculous. We were talking yesterday uh, as, as early as, and we're all familiar perhaps with the book Light and Truth, Robert Benjamin Lewis. R.B. Lewis claimed that everybody was black. I think, uh, when was Light and Truth? 1853, maybe? Uh, no, maybe earlier than that. But anyway, Martin Delaney writes a, an article and says, man, this guy, Lewis, is crazy. Think how contemporary this is in 1998 where people are claiming that everybody was black. Mm -hmm. Delaney says, Robert Lewis claims in his book Light and Truth that everybody in ancient antiquity from Plato to Socrates there was black. He says, uh, maybe it was Parkinson, somebody in his book claims that everybody was white, including that. He said, both of these books are equally wrong. Why don't we sell them together as a set? <laughs> maybe we let people go out and lecture. Let them both go out together because this does black people harm. Here we are in 1998. You ever wonder about when you see a flyer, such and such, going to debate so and so? You ever watch World uh, WWF wrestling on TV? And the only people who think it's real is them hillbillies in the crowd. Yeah! Spitting on the wrestlers. And you sit there and look at these fools. How do you keep digging up Mary Lefkowitz to fight? Because, see, she got an agent, and you got an agent. And how y'all all of a sudden show up at the same place five dates in a row over a six month period to debate the same issues? Let's deal with Martin Delaney talking about Robert Benjamin Lewis and maybe we'll find a smoking gun as to how these people keep getting dug up to fight. Because see, they don't fight for free. <laughs> but anyway, as we continue, John Henry Clark, always the critical voice about this. The one time they had him on stage with Lefkowitz and all the rest of them. What does he say? I don't debate except for my equals. Anybody else I teach? One time and he's done with them. You don't make this into a hustle. You don't spend the rest of your life making dough two, five, ten thousand dollars a clip arguing with these crackers over the same tired argument that we know? Mary Lefkowitz knows nothing about ancient Egypt. She barely knows Greek. Obenga, who reads Greek like if it was newspaper or Greek, he'd rather read it in Greek than English. Maybe that shows his francophone tendencies. We always joke about that. But the point I'm trying to make is, he said Mary Lefkowitz would be I'd give her F in my Greek class. She don't even know Greek. Much less coming on my turf. I go on her turf and blow it out. Who's arguing with her? Somebody who, you know, either don't know what they're talking about or who's making a nice little penny off this. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, as we continue, we see Woodson, he begins attending Woodson's meetings and this old guard begins to influence him. People like Lorenzo Green, people like uh, Arupheus Ambush Taylor. These are, these are people who trained under Woodson. And they're beginning to influence John Henry Clark. You know, the old cats that sit in the back of the room and don't agree with anything because they done read all the books and say, ah, you misinterpreting that. The people that keep you honest, in other respects. Carji Woodson, very cynical, old, crusty, curmudgeonly, but I'm going to keep it straight because it's too important to get it wrong. They're influencing John Henry Clark, who already, already has the Scholars Without Portfolio. Now he's engaging these guys. John O. Franklin and John Henry Clark around about the same age. Why is John O. Franklin venerated as much as he is? Why is he held up as the standard as much as he is? John O. Franklin was the first major historian in the mid 20th century who was not trained by Carter G. Woodson. And white folks made it a little, not much, but a little easier for him because they could never, ever, ever come to peace with Carter G. Woodson. Woodson wouldn't take no stuff. If he got 15 cents of a grant, he would tell Carnegie or Rockefeller, go to hell, I'm going to write what I want. If you don't like it, take your money back. Du Bois said we're going to do an Encyclopedia Africana. The voice said, I'm already starting. And you know what? I don't even like your attitude because you get money from white folks. They're going to tell you what to write. What it's in the literature. Read Du Bois' correspondence. That's Read Woodson's correspondence. And poor Rayford Logan, one of us, a student of Woodson, trying to make peace between Du Bois and Woodson, ended up getting dissed by both of them. That's right. <laughs> he said, oh, why can't y'all fight? Wait a minute. When Woodson dies in 1915, a very moving article in Masters and Mainstream written by Du Bois. Du Bois was a very interesting guy. In addition to reinventing himself, he tried to comment on everybody else. He wrote about Woodson, obit he wrote an obituary. He said, when I wrote the obituary, I, I wrote to Rayford Logan. And I said, 15 minutes? Okay, thank you. I said, uh, what do you know about the old man? Who were his likes? What did he do? I mean, I don't, I don't know what he did for fun. Rayford Logan wrote him back and said, I don't know, he loved kids. I saw him play cards. I don't know what he did for fun. And no, I understand now. <clears throat> Logan knew Carter G. Woodson. Intimately, when you read Lorenzo Green's diaries, these was guys that worked all day, 
ate an humble dinner and went to sleep and got up early the next morning, chopped some wood, did a well for the wood stove and went right back to work. They know each other in D.C. So I don't know what he did. I know when he died, they cleaned out his room and among his personal effects is they found a couple of bottles of liquor, but I can't imagine that it was for anything other than medicinal purposes. He never married, many kids. What kind of sacrifices do you make? I mean, you're serious. I'm not saying that he had to make those kind of sacrifices. I'm saying there's no correspondence about what he did. The only thing they found some liquor bottles. And I'm not accusing Carl G. Woodson of anything, but I know all the sacrifices I know of just from reading the literature. I'm thinking to myself, shit, I might have been a real stone alcoholic. You never get no money. You never have lived comfortably. You're living from not to not. The whole time you was holding up the whole end of the history movement trying to publish and hold people to a standard and everybody's steady more telling you just how crazy you are. And start coming to, but anyway, so Woodson students begin to influence Clark. The meetings are chaired by Walter Fisher of Morgan State College, Stone Cold Anti-Communist. Clark says, I didn't read a paper at the ASNLH for seven years <laughs> because, you know, I was hanging out with some of the communists. I never remember the communist party, but, you know, I would talk with them. So I didn't read a paper at the association for years, man. Them guys was anti-communists because, you know, they had their vein. They didn't want to hear nothing. They too busy about, and it wasn't because they loved America, but because we got to solve the problem right here on the ground. Let's not even get involved in that stuff because y'all people are going to be, they thought perhaps we could cut out some space to negotiate here. Not to love white folks, but to create some space where we could breathe. And it was a, it was a, it was a fierce fight. We see them black studies in the 70s. But anyway, at that time, during, the 50, uh, during that period, Clark's working at NBC. He calls himself Night Chief of Maintenance, then Head of the Typing Pool. How many people do you know now who would work, write, write poetry, fiction, travel, do whatever, and do their work like that in daytime, they mopping floors or typing? A lot of people have to do it. See, there's a reason why ASCAC has an influence that it does. This is not association of professional scholars. I have a PhD because when I was in law school, I went to First World Alliance, sat on my floor with my legs crossed, and it's the first time in 1989 I ever saw John Henry Clark. And I said, that's, that's what I would like to do. But that's an apprentice tradition. You don't just get there by reading a book. And I kept going to school because I said, we can add that to the fire, not to make it off into no hustle. That's the only reason I'm sitting in Philadelphia and ran into black studies and found out it's a big hustle in black studies and one of them's going wrong right in North Philadelphia it's a hustle and that's the reason that it's the hard time that I had it's a genealogy and I'll be damned if I ever betray that genealogy because there's a, there's a reason for that, that's, that's right and so when we defended our dissertations yeah the crackers here, yeah, we got a PhD whatever but at that dissertation defense ASCAP came and the nationalists gave us our credentials and all the crackers had to sit there and say be <laughs> That's right. Because he didn't do that. But yes, he did, because we're his representatives. That's, that's why the organization is what it is. That's why ain't nobody no higher, no lower than anybody else. Because of situations like this. All right. Because the people who founded it were clear about scholars without portfolio. Okay, 1954, we could know Brown versus Board of Education. But more importantly for us, three books come out. Stolen Legacy. Nations Negrese Culture, Shake Out the Joke is busting into the scene. He was a student in the 1940s in Paris, leading the student activist revolt. He's writing about, can we speak of an African renaissance, 1948. 1954, he publishes his book, Black Nations and Culture. I'm ending this debate on ancient Egypt. Matter of fact, I'm gonna open it up to end it, because see, I know and y'all know too. So he does that. Also, John Edward DeGrab Johnson, Ghanaian, wrote a book called African Glory. Why is African Glory republished by Black Classic Press with a preface by John Henry Clark? These texts become alive to us and one of the reasons we walk around with them under our arms. And sometimes like Dr. Clark once said in Newark about 91, talking about Dr. Ben, even though sometimes we use the books as furniture, we still have the books <laughs> because they're kept alive from generation to generation and some, some read. So, um, 1955 through 57, we see integration begin in a significant stage. Arkansas, Little Rock, Nine, whatever. But what's important because 1955, 1957, the Montgomery bus boycott. Yes, King's influenced by Gandhi, but don't ever forget in 1957, Kwame Nkrumah invited him to come to the inauguration 
of the independent state of God. And he's there, and he writes about it when he comes back. He writes about Africa. Why is that important symbolically? Not just for King's development, but for national development. Why? Because Eisenhower's old army general. He knows what the hell's going on. The whole black world's getting ready to bust out, and we can't keep treating these black people the way we're treating them because they may just decide to link up with them instead of deal with us. The civil rights movement is as much about what's going on in the black world as it is going about what's going on just in America. So it's very important to, to put that context. And in 1958, John Clark takes his first trip to Africa. Remember from the film, right? What are you doing in my country? I'm broke, I ain't got no money to go home. In Krumah, Harlem History Club. What you doing, man? What you doing, what you doing in my country? I will put your uh, Harlem behind the work. And I'm sure he cleaned it up for the film. Works on the newspaper, got an even news in a crowd. Journalists. What does a journalist do? Write in clear language, people understand. You want to find somebody very well trained in the English language? Go to Africa. <laughs> Why? Well, we live in America. No, 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 no. The British have the English language. That's why it's called English, not American. They look at us as barbarians. Y'all abuse the English language. Who goes to school to learn the English language better than anybody? Go to colonial schools, some of the colonial schools. They learn that language. This cat's writing for a newspaper with, hey, man, don't be splitting them parts. You learn how to write with people who know what they're doing. Clark, apprenticing there in, in, in Ghana. 58 to 60, he publishes a series of articles in the Pittsburgh Courier, The Lives of the Great African Chiefs. He's talking about those great African chiefs up to the day he's gone from here. Writes in Presence African, weight keeping among the Ga people. He watches a, a wake of the God. How ironic then that eventually they instill him as an elder. That's the reason why the God picked him. This goes back to the 60s, really 1959. The period of radicalization, 1960 to 1967. Oh, Sit in movement begins. 1961, Freedom Ways magazine starts. This is the first international conference of Africanists takes place. And Krumah gives a lecture there. Funny lecture where he talks about creating an African center, an African cultural perspective. This stuff not original. 1962, uh, Clark is at the second International Congress of Africanists. That's where he is formally introduced to Sheikh Atta Joe. Remember what James Baldwin wrote about Sheikh Atta Joe at a lecture? He was like, well, this guy Joe started talking about ancient Egypt. And, you know, it was, it was interesting, but then he lost half the crowd. I really don't see the relevance this is Ball, brilliant essayist, clearly affected by race, was you know, very sharp, but he hadn't linked up with Africa yet. Clark is there. And Clark knows Ball when they in circles together. Remember the Harlem Writers Guild, John Oliver Killens, all these people hanging out. All that dialogue is going on. So, 1963, W.E.B. Du Bois dies. Before he dies in his uh, memorandum to the Secretariat, because remember, a crewman invites him to come to Ghana to live. One of his projects, he's supposed to do this Encyclopedia Africana. One of the things he, he uh, matter of fact, I, well, I won't read it to you because I don't have it a minute. But uh, I, well, I will give you the site. But uh, Afrocentric was defined in 1962 by the Secretary of the Encyclopedia Africana for the purpose of distinguishing a geographical focus from a racial focus. Du Bois, director of the project, talks about writing the Encyclopedia Africana from an Afrocentric perspective. It's 1962. 1963, he's dead. 64, the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party is founded. And of course, we know Fannie Lou Hamer comes on the scene, and that brings our brother in, as Dr. Bob Murad talked about yesterday, Kwame Ture. We see the incubation of the early 60s as y'all move that movement. And we see Stokely Carmichael emerging in that on the ground work. Not just Stokely Carmichael and Dr. Bob Murad, people like Donna uh, Richards, Donna Moses, Bob and Donna Moses. First time I met Remember Remind Me, I'm like, Remember, why do I always leave you out of the narrative? I don't never see all these books on the 60s and SNCC talk about you, because you right there in Mississippi with them. And she's talking, yeah, you know they do that. Read the books on the 60s. Nobody talks about Marimba Ani when she was Donna Moses. Then she goes to Africa with them when Fanny Hamer went, and Kwame Ture swept her up in his arms, and they all went, they had, I mean, just she's there with John Lewis and then when Stoney Tom, I'm like, what's going on here? I want to know who's writing this narrative. So we got a lot of, you know, discourse we get, we get into. But anyway, 1964, Clark's book comes out, Harlem, USA. 
He's writing about his beloved Harlem. And of course, 1965, Malcolm X is assassinated. The Watts insurrections jump off. The Selma to Montgomery march in many ways marks the bracket of the end of that phase of the civil rights movement because soon after that in Mississippi, Kwame Trace said, I've been going to jail 27 times. I've got an unlost count. I'll be dead. What we need now is black power. Willie Ricks is there, who still, from my understanding, unless he passed recently in Atlanta. Yes, sir. They call him the Africa Man. Some of the people that are around Clark Atlanta University campus. It's amazing how we just don't deal with our people who are still here. Willie Ricks is out there, and Carmen Trey is safe, out there before with other folks, priming people for black power. You see it in the Eyes on the Prize segment, Henry Hampton, who just made his transition. The Eyes on the Prize segment, where he says, you know, uh, what does Carmen Trey say? The people went out, and they said black power, and he said that Willie Ricks came back and said, uh, we said black power, and they dropped their hoes. And I looked at Courtney Cox, and I said, huh, obviously you picked the wrong man for this task, this fancy shit. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 they said. What does he do? He gets on top of that truck, he said, we want black power. And the whole crowd goes off. 1965 really marks the end of that phase of the civil rights movement and the introduction to the black power phase. Clark's there, ground zero. 1966, he publishes his volume edited American Negro Short Stories, including the famous short story, The Boy Who Painted Christ Black. But you remember he gave that lecture <laughs> 30 years ago. 1968, Professor John Henry Clark. Why do I call a professor? Because 1968 marks the formation of the African Heritage Studies Association. He also publishes William Styron's Nat Turner, black, 10 Black Writers Respond. Very prolific right here, 1969. He comes to Cornell's newly established African Studies Research Center. He also publishes Malcolm X, The Man in His Times, Harlem, A Community in Transitions, which is the second revised edition of Harlem, USA. Malcolm X, very important in his life. We know we, we don't have time to talk about it right now, but we all know how Dr. Clark would talk about his influence, Malcolm X's influence on him including that phrase that stuck in his head that he gave to us. Always do your best work. Always do your best work. And he said, all I ever wanted to be was a great classroom teacher, like my third grade teacher, Miss Evelina Taylor. So he would always say those things, that always do your best work. 1970, he's still at Cornell. Black White Alliances, a very important essay he wrote out that uh, was published in Chicago, The Slave Trade and Slavery, his book there, Black Titan, W.E.B. Du Bois. Now he, now he publishes a book with the Freedom Ways and just on Du Bois. He's putting these exemplars out. 71 to 72, while he's at Cornell, the National Council of Black Studies is formed in 1972, and of course the Gary Political Commission is 1972. We don't have really time to talk about it tonight, but the whole notion of politicized, the nationalist influence on national politics in Gary. We got Hatcher, we got Stokes, we're gonna take the country, we're gonna run Shirley Chisholm, we're gonna do the right, we got Queen Mother Moore standing on stage, we got Amiri Baraka trying to keep the delegation together. You remember I was in the prize when Coleman Young and them gonna walk out from Detroit, like, no, Michigan, Michigan. Come back. We're trying to build some sense of unity here. What is happening at this period, though, now by 1973, nationalists are organizing and publishing as well. The Afrocentric World Review comes out, founded by the Association of African Historians. Anderson Thompson was the founder of that organization. But during this period, Clark and Ben come together and publish a curriculum for studying black people, black studies curriculum. And they talk about an Afrocentric worldview. It's in the book entitled African Congress edited by Amiri Barak. A whole curriculum. So, you know, we got these curriculums as, as we're gathering them now, talking about them, and trying to operationalize them. Now, of course, 1974, as black NASA's know, very important in our genealogy, we know the great Congress of African Peoples in 1974, the whole move between the black nationalists, the black Marxist Leninists, uh, Barakas move, and the whole fallout and all these discussions that are going on. 1975, oh, 1974, Garvey, Marcus Garvey and the Vision of Africa. Look at how he's publishing these exemplars. Garvey, Du Bois, Malcolm X. 19, oh wow, I went over. Okay, about five minutes. Clark and International Congress of Africanists at Addis Ababa. He writes about that in his book, My Life in Search of Africa. 1975, Paul Robeson dies. Remember, he worked with Robeson on Freedom Magazine. Paul Robeson was the first international superstar of any color, shape, form, or fashion. Rose Scholar, not, not a Rose Scholar, that was uh, Elaine Locke. He was a scholar at Rutgers, top of the line, all-American football player, athlete, brilliant actor, did Othello in Europe and America, which means even white folks had to say, hey, this nigga's better than all the white people. <laughs> in their parlance, we know, of course, why? Because Sterling Stuckey, as he said, he quoted Paul Robeson, why? I want to be African. Masters over 20 languages, but the ones that he found the most resonance with were the African languages, the Ifi uh, languages, the languages of the Congo Basin. He dealt with Ivey, he dealt with uh, Tree, he, he, Yoruba, he 
learn these languages, and then he started talking about, I gotta write out a cultural logic. When you read, uh, we talked about it the other day, when you read, uh, with Brian, when you read uh, Martin Duberman's book on Paul Robeson, even though he does a terrible job of Robeson, he does unearth some things about Robeson. One of the things is, he studied languages and started talking about the cultural unity of black people, and he said, I want to be an African. The first international superstar, from continent to continent, singing, acting, he was the man, period. They said he was a communist. He went from being the first international superstar that couldn't leave the United States, that couldn't leave the city he was in. And he tried to break Paul Robeson's spirit. He died right here in Philadelphia, right up there on Walnut Street. His sister would take him out to Rittenhouse Square Park, right down there on Walnut. He'd sit there, unremembered, unknown, broken, 10 years. 1978. Two books under Clark's editorship, Pan-Africanism and the Liberation of South Africa, a tribute to W. Du Bois, and Paul Robeson's 80 birth, 80th birthday tribute. 1970, uh, 1983, he publishes Ahmed Baba, a scholar of old Africa. I'm going to continue, I'm going to quickly finish. 83 to 87, The Organization of Intellectual Insurgency for Clark. 1984, the first Ancient Comedic, Stu Comedic Studies Conference in L.A., ASCAC is born as an organization. Clark's on the Council of Elders. And this is after a decade where they were traveling, doing those lectures. That's why you see Clark, Ben Yachin in, in that genealogy, Chancellor Williams, John Jackson. This is the part of that founding spirit. 85, the second Ancient Comedic Studies Conference in Chicago, Temple's PhD program started in African American Studies. Everybody put their bets on Temple. All the nationalists, NCBS, ASCAC, everybody put their energy and sent all their best students here. Within five years, a lot of those students had left. It's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. 1987, The Voyage to Kemet for ASCAP, over 700 folks. Also, a book comes out saying half of what we've been saying and not the way we like it, Martin Bernal's Black Athena. And all of a sudden, white folks are interested in the Nile Valley because of this guy who's a scholar in Chinese. Which brings us to the last decade of Clark's life, 1988 to 1998, the commercialization. 1988, he publishes a small pamphlet uh, with Sister Joan Rattray. It's called Africans Away From Home, the purple pamphlet where he talks about that theme of the Africans Away From Home. And I really didn't get to number three, exemplars and prescriptions, because that's where I go through the themes of some of his life. I'll just mention them uh, as I finish this little period here. 91, Africans at the Crossroads, the big book, where he starts downloading his computer, as we say. Rebellion and Rhyme, some of his early poetry, and New Dimensions in African History, where he revisits that study guide and gives us an excellent beginning point for the study of African history. Chapter by chapter. One of his study guys from his work at Hunter College. 92, Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. 93, African People in the World History. 94, My Life in Search of Africa. Who Betrayed the African World Revolution and other essays. Why? Because by 1998, when he passes, the decade of the 90s witnessed the commercialization of what we were talking about. Remember this genealogy we've been talking about? It's a self-trained genealogy. What did he always say? I'm a self-trained scholar. I don't have, you know, degrees, I ended up with them, but you know. This movement was intersected. Now, we've been talking about genealogy. I don't want to talk linear, but when we, we're talking about coming through the history from Africa. Let's go this way. Coming from Africa, coming across. It's radically intersected in the mid-70s by university-trained people, some of whom had no experience in the community, but become the authority on that discourse. So as Clark and them come through, then you get this, and this keeps going, it takes a different look now. That's a very respectable discourse. This man couldn't make a living doing what he was doing. <coughs> Mopping floors. At the same time, the white scholars, and we go back through white intellectual history, we'd be glad if we go through uh, the, the New York School of Intellectual, we go through what happened at City University of New York, so we can talk about what happens. It ain't just, well, no, nobody can do a job. That's not true. Go look at Herbert Marcuse, go look back at the people in the 1940s and 50s, uh, when you look at it, white intellectuals with no degrees who were getting jobs at universities and teaching and being very well respected, particularly those in literature. So, I mean, it ain't just that all people say, well, ah, no, that's not true. Okay, fine. One thing we was trained, Dr. Clark always say, keep your library in your head because you won't have time to go to the library if you're in a fight. So, if you won't argue, then let's go get the books. But, matter of fact, since we don't have time, cite me your references and I'll write them down and we'll come back. So, anyway, we see um, the last period of his life and, and that really. I know it's, it's, it's 6 o'clock now and I'm taking up the time. Um, I'll, I'll conclude by 
giving you the, uh, the categories that the major themes in his work, which I named some of the book titles, but I really didn't talk about the themes. Uh, number one, the formation of Africana resistance, consistent in his work. We see that particularly when he deals with continental Africa and the 19th century United States and the Caribbean. 19th century Africana resistance is there. His focus on criticism. Clark was an astute observer of the cultural public sphere. He always dealt with the relationship of popular culture to teaching of history. You know, he talked about the How Are You Act program when he was teaching in the 60s. He said, I'd give these kids contemporary examples because they thought history was dry. You know what Barbara Adams said in Hunter College? She said, if I had learned history like this before, I would maybe have studied a little closer. Clark understood the importance of understanding the public sphere. And understand that, listen to this course, a lot of people didn't understand. Because in the 40s and 50s, those white boys went back to Germany from the Frankfurt School, Adorno and uh, Horkheimer, and they were writing about the, cult, the cultural sphere. They finally began to understand, and that's why they got cultural studies, right? Now, uh, the fourth thing, Clark, you see his socialization and his education in the introductions to the books that we have now. Stuff like When Africa Awakes, Book of the Beginnings, Introduction to African Civilizations, which is probably his most famous preface to John Jackson's book. World's Great Men of Color, Iceman Inheritance, Sea Island Roots, The Arab Invasions of Egypt. Why would somebody go back and get this one book out of all the books that have been published? Why? Because that's what they were learned at the uh, Harlem History Club. Tropical Dependency and so on. Biographical. This is another major theme. The study of exemplars. You must study people's lives in order to model them in terms of exemplars. So you see this in his writing on Ahmed Baba, for example, Timbuktu. His writing on Du Bois, Black Titan, Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey in the Vision of Africa, Malcolm X, Malcolm X the man in his time, Paul Robeson, he edited one too, Paul Robeson the great forerunner. Clark's ability to construct images of the heroic to emulate. Why in his lectures would he always stop at Arthur Schomburg? Stop at Willis Huggy, stop at, Max, uh, at Malcolm. The preservation of rituals of intellectual work through narrative construction. For example, the rituals of education, good listening, self-training, Dialogue, the ritual of preservation, bibliophile. Book collectors are lost art. People say they can just download it off the back. Books just, okay, I get a book, sometime I buy a book. This was a, this was a ritual of preservation. John Jackson would put his book hunting clothes on. He had a hat and a cape, and he'd go out hunting books like you hunt animals. Yeah, and you take somebody with you and then they learn that. You go to these people's house, you can't get in for all the books. You go to other people's houses, they got about 15, 20 books, maybe 200 books, and the computer. Well, I don't need all that, because I mean, you know what? When they turn electricity off, then you'll find out the ritual of preservation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's very important. This is the thing, these are the things we know, because I mean, you have all your results, now you can cut and paste, now you can't cut and paste. It's got to be here, and you got to have the tangible. Autobiographical. The examined life. Du Bois talks about this. I'm going to live my life. Yeah, I, I know, it's, it's got to be. Okay. This will be the I'm gonna close. I'm gonna close here. Du Bois said, "I got to live my life in a way that I'm interrogating my life the whole time I'm living." Now, of course, he left stuff out. We all know, and people get fast. That's why I'm waiting for volume two of uh, which guy's book? David Levering Lewis's bottom because Levering Lewis got an interest. Just like Duberman had in Robeson, he got an interest in Du Bois's sex life, and he tried to drop all the hints that Du Bois was kicking it with Jesse Fawcett whenever he would come to Philly. And you know what? If he was, what if he wasn't? I mean, he did leave that out of the autobiography, but at the same time, he did interrogate him. Nobody's gonna tell everything, but the things he did leave about himself were very honest in terms of I didn't do this work, I didn't do this, I made a mistake here. Clark did the same thing. You hear Clark lecture, he's gonna pepper it with what I did and didn't do. I made the bad choice. Maybe I, didn't, yeah, maybe I didn't treat my wife the way I was supposed to. Maybe I neglected my kids when I should have done this. And it's not like he's feeling bad. What he's doing is, it's self-interrogation. And it's, what that does is give a model. Now, some people get up and they ask, don't stink. I'm this, I'm that. But what about, I don't want to talk about it. But that's important because you're telling us how to live. Yeah, but you don't. You do what I say and not as I do. How is that African? The ritual is autobiographical in terms of self-reflection. So we see this in his autobiographical stuff. So his self-analysis followed him to engage in a broader critique. Because once you engage in self-analysis, then you can use that self-exemplar in other situations. He said, well, why didn't Clark agree with Farrakhan? Well, he didn't disagree completely with Farrakhan, but once you put yourself out there, then you can have a dialogue. The central function of wise instruction. All I ever wanted to be was a great classroom teacher. That was Clark's mantra, almost. And, and he passed it on. The, the final section I wanted to talk about was uh, his philosophy of history, but that's a whole another uh, a really kind of detailed discussion. But I just wanted to, to lay that out 
to give you a sense of some of the ways I think we could begin to talk about Dr. Clark's life and work so that we can do a, a good requiem to him and use that work to go on instead of do what typically happens, which is fetishize the person. And they become a symbolic fetish that's called upon but reified, but really turned into a symbol rather than a living exemplar. Because a symbol is very easy to preserve. And it was very interesting to watch at the funeral. A symbol is very easy to preserve. But if Clark was there, that funeral probably could have been, you know, it would have been a very interesting dialogue to engage in. You? Let's have a talk. Let's have a talk, because I may not have but 15 minutes left on the earth, so I think the audience needs to understand my position. So that's it. Let me, let me please. Let me first. Yes. Uh, Patient, Brother Hannibal. Right. And uh, I think, let me first say that I don't know when it came in. Okay. But that John Jackson clearly was influenced by that contrarian, I don't know what we want to call it, theos theos theosophist right. tradition. Right. Right. I mean, Helena Blavatsky, uh, uh, Ingersoll. Mm -hmm. Because you know American atheist pe president of Republic and stuff, but I know that Ingersoll was in New York at that time. As a matter of fact, when you go down maybe on 14th and Park Avenue, right, buttressing the park, that's where he lived, and he would deliver lectures, which of course were eventually published in book forms. We need to find the chronology um, of the people I know, and somebody here may know, and that would be very helpful to me, to us. Um, Larry Crow in Chicago, because you know John Jackson spent his last years there, yeah. is one of the people who was relatively close to him, and I know Renoko Rashidi in there, and James Brunson spent time with Clark. So maybe we can ask them, because I think that's a crucial point, because that's where, really, like you say, in terms of Massey, Church Ward, and all this stuff on Christianity, that tradition is informed more by John Jackson than John Henry Clark. You're absolutely right. So that, that's, that's a good point. I'm going to break that down, because we need, we need to find that out. We'll get I'm together. No, we we'll be helping. <laughs> We're going to get there. We're going to get that together. Help each other. Thanks, Aisha. I think, it's, it's, I guess it's kind of basic. I try to take the cue from, from Clark and how even how Jake Perez, I think, gives a good example of that. Because we're all Africans, it's a family discourse. So we obviously don't want to throw nobody out because then we fall into the same traps other people fall into. But at the same time, there's a there's a barometer. <coughs> um, one of the things I think we can do is continue to study and identify those best practices that we have engaged in over time and just continue to refer to them. And what happens is I think over time is that anybody who chooses not to do that identifies themselves as somebody who's not about what we're about. And I, and I, I have to say that really personally for me because you know I'm, I'm still trying to come to terms with what happened at Temple and that's very personal. Uh, and I'm not saying in terms of private, but I'm saying it happened to me. So I see, you know, we talk about ancient Egypt and there's nobody at Temple teaching ancient Egypt. There's nobody who can really do no glyphs. And, that, and rather than criticize, I think what we can do is, in organizations like this, rededicate ourselves to doing that study so that that becomes irrelevant. Because it's going to happen anyway, I think. And in the public schools, I think, you know, to get to the really essence of that part of, of, of your economy, because I, you know, I know you there and you helped bring me in to work with that. I think that it's important that more and more people become aware of what's going on in the public schools and lend our talents and Dr. Clark provides a good example of those talents. It's not about having a degree. It's about, I'm going to do the work. And as we do the work, we can bust open that thing because instead of somebody paying a consultant to come in, people say, if it's going to our kids, I'll be there. And you know what? Last night, I just finished. I didn't, you know, I ain't reading all the books, but I just finished a book on my leaf. And I saw something in there, and I read something, and something that's going in this curriculum that ain't right. I'll come to the next meeting. Just as simple as that, you know what I mean? And, and, and it didn't cost anybody any money. The community can monitor it. And I think that's the kind of things we can do. And ultimately, the other stuff will take care of itself because they're going to pay for it. As a matter of fact, the more we do that, the more they're going to try to raise people up and say, you can't do it, they're going to do it. But we just refute that by saying, what are your sources? I mean, I think those are the kind of things we can do. who has what and get people the resources to duplicate you know what I'm saying so because people are very provincial I don't blame them a lot of them don't let stuff leave their house <laughs> I don't blame them. but we give them some tapes and a dubber and say we're coming for a week in Philly we're going here 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 and here we're going to tape and you keep your tapes and like, yes, maybe we could do that so yes sir I'm sorry yes I'd like to thank you for reassuring me that I can rest easy after hearing young scholars like you and being associated with 
other young scholars like Coco. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to ask this question. Yes. John had a uh, John Henry Clark had a uh, Philadelphia period, didn't he? When he worked at the Tribune here, did he uh, write anything? That I'm not aware of. That's a complete glitch in my knowledge. Does anybody know anybody? He's supposed to have worked for the Philadelphia Tribune for a short period of time. You know what? I appreciate that. As a so I'm going to investigate. Did, did you know, Jim, do you know about it? I'm asking. Exactly. I know at some point he was working with a group of other scholars uh, at the Science Center for the Fourth Wall. There is a woman I knew in Philadelphia. We need to get together because I need to understand. I do know that he did contribute to the curriculums. I mean, as I issued was going, we talked about that. He, 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 he sanctioned one of the early curriculums that came out of public schools that Ed Robinson and the other people worked on. So, but I'm, I'm writing that name. Yes, sir. Do you know the, the dates maybe? No, right? I wouldn't know the dates, but it seemed to have been for a brief period. No problem. We'll, we'll find it because that's, that's probably a very rich vein. Thank you. But please go. And uh, I traveled with uh, Dr. Ben to, to the Nile Valley quite a few years ago. And he referred, he used to hold court at the dinner table in his room. And we discussed different things. And he referred to a scholar that would have been around the library period that uh, taught at one of the Ivy League colleges. But in the records of the college, he's listed as a janitor. If you were trying to... Hubert Harrison, probably. Yeah, if you were trying Huber, to... Hubert Harrison lectured at Columbia, but they listed him as a lecturer, and maybe they might have listed him as a janitor too, because they couldn't they couldn't hire him to teach. But Harrison was so brilliant that the, the students demanded that they had him in class, but they couldn't pay him or hire him as a professor. So they I don't even think they let they listed him as a lecturer. We had to go back and check, but that might be who he's talking about. But then I'll check and see, because Harrison was Harrison. That was one of the part part of his lore. They knew him for that. That he they could. But I'm gonna check though on that as well. I think Carruthers has, what he has said on chronology gives us a good lens. And I think, matter of fact, one of the first places he tested that chronology out was here at the International House for ASCAP a couple of years ago, back in January, maybe three, three years ago, where he laid that chronology out. I think that gives us a sense of reperiodization. If you look at the World History Project, what he's written, what Bula Lele Bogo has written, gives us a sense. For Clark, I think Clark. I think Anderson Thompson gave us a good flavor of Clark's perspective. I think Clark's perspective was less a um, less a chronological discussion of where we should begin and more a philosophical statement on the fact that we should begin somewhere other than where we are now. And I think so what happened was I think Clark and others laid out the fact that we need to change the chronology. Then Carruthers, uh, Riketty Wimby, as, uh, as Hannah was talking about yesterday, and others have now begun to try to change it. So, uh, but in terms of historical, in terms of chronology and genealogy of identity, I think some of the things that I talked about give us a sense of Clark's perspective. He linked it very much to, to people and to movements. So the history was linked to what black people were doing, not only in one space, but he would take a year and say, what are black people doing around the world in that year? Then he would link exemplars of individuals whose practices we should copy. You know, what was Du Bois doing? What was Rosa doing? What was Malcolm X doing? What was Harry Tubman doing? What did people do? So I think that's in terms of his historical thought of how we should do chronology. And, and it was also one that didn't pay, that paid strict attention to linear time, but at the same time did, as Hell said, jumped around. And as he would always say, in the tradition he was raised, Black Baptist tradition, I state my text, I leave my text, I return to the text. So he would leave, a, he would start with a grounding statement and go everywhere in whatever sense, and then come back to the text to communicate the themes that he wanted to, to have be done. So I think in the general sense, I think he wrote that way too in terms of history. Yes. Historical narrative wasn't as important as the general themes, but he, he, would, he would drop into chronology when he needed to, but it would always, you know, kind of do it. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I think something you said to me yesterday is a good uh, symbol. Um, if you don't mind me talking. Because you know, this brother is a Yoruba priest. As you came into your stages, you've been in your whole life. And as you get initiated in different stages, they open up more doors. But it's a lifelong process. 
Now, I'm quite sure somebody at Penn who has spent five years studying Europe, or 10 years, or 15 to 30 years for that matter, may have lived over, you know, wasn't born in it, didn't come up in it, doesn't believe it. It's their scholarly profession. Very interesting to watch how they operate. When there's no vested interest, it's an academic thing and it can be turned into anything. When there's a move to understand it, they come get you. Because they need to know. There are certain things you can't tell them. And wouldn't tell them. A, because you ain't in the tradition. And B, because even if you were in the tradition, you wouldn't be talking about some of this stuff out here the way you are. And you're messing it up. But the point I'm trying to get back to, which gets to your original thing of you know what the distinction is. Dr. Thompson calls it Negro historiography. Or Sambo historiography. Entertainment history. The academy has become a location for entertainment historians who inform on blackness in venues where the interests of black people are not the primary thing. And when asked about why they do it, they say, well, because we need to be here. I say, no, let's go look at the history of this struggle. The struggle for black studies was not so that black people could get jobs informing on black people to white people. The history of black studies was carving out space to get our people a certain education so that we could continue to nation build, whether we stayed there or moved on. And the goal wasn't to be here forever. So with that in mind, I think the distinction is that when we look at the sacrifices made in intellectual work, it's not an academic venture. Like you said, you mop floors so you can continue to read books. Clark would always talk about going home on Friday night from setting up tables. His greatest pleasure was knowing he was going to finish off the last volume of a book that he had. And how the only thing he had in his room, his rented room in New York, was the books all around his bed and under his bed, and that's it. And talking about that, and I think that academic work now has become lucrative. And because it's become lucrative, it's not an apprentice tradition. So that priestesses and priests in an intellectual work have no vested interest. You're not going to let anybody violate your tradition because it represents something beyond just studying it. No, that's, that's a way of life. Similarly, I think Dr. Clark and all of us think that way about our tradition. An academic has no vested interest. They can write about that or something else. And because they have no vested interest, they'll never know. And they can't, you know. And I, and I, but I do think that there's a high on one end, the tradition. Then on the other end, there's a complete sellout. Between there is a continuum. So, and people move up back and forth on that continuum. Sometimes they're closer to the sellout, sometimes they're closer to the preserver of the tradition. And I think one of the things we could do usefully is at least establish the continuum and establish what different points along it look like so that people can then have an informed decision about where they want to be. But they can no longer move up and down that continuum in obscurity or with ease. And when they move this way, it's like, hey, man, or hey, sister, you're moving this way. When they move that way, we say, okay, that's good. So I mean, I think that's one of the things. Joe, I'm sorry. I'll say this, Brother Hannibal. As, you know I don't agree with you. No, of course. But I mean, I'm, I say this as, as, as Brother Aunt Mira always said, let the ancestors speak. When we read Clark's reaction, you remember what he said about Cruz. Mm -hmm. Harold Cruz was a poor writer who nobody liked and nobody wanted to hang out with. Sometimes when you read a book, <laughs> you can get a sense for the person. Because he dogs Clark and been yakking it. But then he says black people haven't, prevented, haven't presented a blueprint for nation building. Right. Ignoring the whole 19th century. Now he was in the Harlem Writers Guild. He was with John Oliver Killings and them. That's right. And uh, and Winston James takes Cruz to task in his book, Holding Aloft the Banner of Ethiopia, for doing just that. You being a historical, an excellent book. But I think that part of it was personally motivated. You know, and, and but I do think in terms of critique he raises to Clark, I think, and to be honest and be fair, and that's the part I didn't get to talk about, but it is in, in the paper and its development. We can't duplicate, we, we shouldn't try. We can't duplicate what Clark went through in this period. We, we live in a different period. During that period, what he was doing could very well have been viewed through a class lens as being more elitist than what Cruz was doing. But to be quite honest, I don't see how mopping floors and being in typhus pool is elitist, unless there was a whole lot of people unemployed. And if you put it in that context, then maybe it does become you know, but at the same time, when you figure that in with Cruz is on, Cruz is still alive. Cruz did in Michigan, and they and they laud and feed Cruz. 
Here's a guy without a PhD, tenure professor, professor emeritus, University of Michigan. Last year they had a huge conference and all the Negro intellectuals from Cornell West on down went to Michigan and lay at the feet of Harold Cruz and talked about how important he was. Why? Because in his manifesto, the crisis of Negro intellectual, they find space for their own sellout behavior. Because they say, that's why I'm at the academy. Because when Harold Cruz wrote the crisis, he was talking about creating us. No, he wasn't. And when you listen to Cruz as an old man, he dogs them all. That's right. You Negroes, damn it, you come in. This ain't what I was talking about, you bourgeois Negro. He hate that bourgeois. He hate bush, bush, bourgeois. I believe if, if Cruz, if you would ask him, maybe that's something to do. Because I don't know how easy to be to get in touch with Cruz. But if he was to call Ann Arbor and ask Harold Cruz about John Henry Clark now, that he's not here physically, right. or go out there and see him, he might have a whole different story. Because he looks more like Clark now. I'm gonna take that <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That might be a good thing to do. As quiet as it's kept. Because without the conference, they don't talk to Cruz. He's, a, he, he's been fetishized. Right. You could probably go out there now and yeah. talk with him all week. You know what I'm saying? Right. So that might be something to do. I mean, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm going to take y'all away. Thank you. Yeah.